Okay, Your Worship, I think we're good to go. All right, thank you. It's two o'clock council, time to get down to work. Today we acknowledge that Collingwood is located on the traditional territory of the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. There's the clock. Including the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg and the Haudenosaunee and Ojibwe peoples. And on lands connected with the Lake Simcoe and Ottawa Saga Treaty of 1818. This is the home of a diverse range of indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors to our society. And before I ask for the motion to adopt the agenda, I have a quick announcement today. Last week was an important week for human rights and diversity milestones. Wednesday, January 27 marked the 76th anniversary of the liberation of the, of the Auschwitz death camp by Soviet troops. Friday, the federal government announced that it intends to make January 29 a national day of remembrance to honor the victims of the deadly 2017 attack on a Quebec City mosque and to combat Islamophobia in Canada. And today marks the beginning of Black History Month in Canada, celebrated since 1995, when Dr. Jean Augustine, Canada's first Black woman parliamentarian, introduced a motion that was passed unanimously by Parliament. The motion read that this House take note of the important contribution of Black Canadians to settlement, growth, and development of Canada, the diversity of the Black community in Canada, and its importance to the history of this country. February is a month to recognize and celebrate the vital role of our Black community and the role they played in the growth and development of our town and an opportunity to embrace our diversity and foster belonging and inclusion. In the powerful words of Martin Luther King, no one is free until we are all free. Diversity is to be celebrated and makes our community stronger. Collingwood is committed to championing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number 11 to be a safe, inclusive and resilient community. Thank you. And with that, I'll look for the motion to adopt the agenda. And the motion reads, uh, go ahead, Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I'm going to just ask for something to be added to the agenda. So I probably need it on the floor first. Sorry, I jumped the gun. Okay. So I will look for a mover in a second or once I've read this in that the content of the Strategic Initiative Standing Committee agenda for February 1, 2021 be adopted as amended. And the item added is 6.5 Andrew Seward, letter re ski industry working group and request for letter of support, January 29, 21. So first I'm gonna get a mover and a seconder, Councillor Berman and Deputy Mayor, and then Councillor Jeffrey, you wanted to speak? Uh, to thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I'd like to add other business to uh, following the, um, uh, I guess eight. Okay, so we'll put in an after a departmental updates. All right, uh, do we know it? Do you have a, uh, uh, Clerk Almas, do I need a seconder for that uh, and then put it on the floor or do we just accept that amendment? Uh, Your Worship, you can accept that as an amendment and if anybody would request that be severed to be voted on separately, you may do so. Okay, well, I will accept it. And unless there's a request to sever, then I will call the vote on the motion all in favor. That is carried unanimously. Thank you. Declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Councillor Doherty and then Councillor Hamlin. Or sorry, Councillor Jeffrey and then Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Um, I have. Um a conflict with respect to 6.5, uh, uh, the ski industry um, working group letter of support. Um, while not direct, I think maybe perhaps under the code of conduct, both, uh, I have two immediate family members who work uh, at Blue Mountain Resorts. So I will be stepping away for the presentation and any, any direction discussion that comes out of that. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. I think we're just having the notice of motion read in today due to the, the timing of, the, of this. So uh, you can remove yourself certainly when the notice is read in if you'd like, but there'll be no voting today. Yeah, I think I'll step away for the uh, presentation as well. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm going to declare a conflict for the item 5.4. It's a deputation by Roz Morrison on behalf of the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay. And I'm a volunteer member of the board of directors for that institute. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hamlin. 
And then item number four, reaffirmation of council code of conduct. Claire Thomas, did you want to speak to that? And then I didn't see that I've got Councillor Berman. So I'll let uh, Clerk Alma speak first and then I'll go to you, Councilor Berman. Certainly, Your Worship. So this is a requirement of uh, Council's Code of Conduct that you annually confirm that you have read, reviewed, and you comply with the Code of Conduct. So we've included it on the Standing Committee and it would be further voted on, uh, separated in an uh, individual motion on the meeting of February the 15th. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Berman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Um, I guess through you to the clerk, because you know I've been sort of chomping at the bit to have council uh, get to review the code of conduct and propose any changes, and we're past the halfway mark in the term. I'm wondering if it would be possible, or if I could ask maybe that um, this be bumped back to the next SIC, and that council could then have a month to forward uh, uh, any recommended changes or whatnot, so that we're actually affirming the new code of conduct and I'm sure you've probably had an ongoing list for two years of, of uh, adjustments you want to make as well um, so before I put that on the table I'd like to hear your feedback or comments thank you your worship uh, further to Councillor Berman's question um, as you'll uh, see through the presentation um, for the follow-up for the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry report that is one of the main items um, I recommend at this time to proceed with the um, affirmation and you can, uh, once it's further reviewed, we can reaffirm again um, as part of that process, but I wouldn't want to, to put it off at this time. Any follow up, Councillor Berman? Uh, yes, through you to the clerk, could you just, maybe it's in the report, remind me what the timeline is then that we would get back an updated uh, code of conduct? Certainly, so we're proposing um, uh, public engagement for a various number of items that are contained within those recommendations. And one of the significant areas is code of conduct. So that's part of our, I believe the phase two that we're looking at with a report back, I believe in, in June. Okay, that's, uh, I'm gonna leave that, see if anybody else wants to comment on it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLeod, did I see your card up? Uh, yes, so that we, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. That is exactly the question that I was about to ask uh, of the clerk regarding the report that's about to come to us. Is there not a hefty dose of things that are coming to change changes to our code of conduct? What I wonder if we, um, if it makes sense to reaffirm and then re re reaffirm in June. It just seems like a, a bit of a waste of time, but. Uh, is there, is there some reason why we wouldn't wait? Is, like, were we not covered uh, by, by something? Were we to wait until till, uh, till June for all of it? Uh, Clerk Thomas? Certainly. Um, so th this is a requirement of the Code of Conduct to do an annual review. It was done last February. So carrying on with the 12 month timeline, you'd be delaying that so you wouldn't be necessarily compliant you know, if we did it uh, uh, a year and a half into, into the year, um, if there's any further comment, I see CEO. Yeah, yeah. Uh, CEO Skinner, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you also to Councillor Berman, I do think that it is worth um, reaffirming with a full understanding that we all um, uh, want to do some updates. And in fact, I've already seen Clerk Almas has uh, significantly edited the code of conduct based on the, uh, the judicial inquiries recommendations and is ready to, um, uh, to start with some of those consultations in the very short term. Um, I did really like Councillor Berman's suggestion that each council member who is so inclined provide their own suggestions for the code of conduct. Um, I think that would also be immensely helpful. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Any follow up, Councillor McConnell? No, I'm mollified. Thank you. Okay. I have Councillor Doherty next. Uh, thank you. Um, I, th I think I'm okay now. Um, I was going to speak to the notion of affirming our uh, code of conduct today as it stands uh, rather than postponing for another few months. Uh, so I, but I'm, I'm happy with the answer that's been provided by the CAO. Thank you. Thank you. Was there anyone else that wanted to comment for the first time before I go back to Councillor Berman? 
Seeing none, Councilor Berman. Oh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I'm good with all those answers. The uh, only thing I would ask maybe through you to the clerk is if, would it be possible rather than getting the report and then weighing in on it, if council were asked in advance of the report so that their comments could be included in the report come out. I see the clerk nodding and the CAO, so I think that is the answer, but I'll just get uh, Clerk Almas to confirm. That is correct, and that, that would be our intentions. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So then um, now th this is a reaffirmation. So I'll look to the clerk. Uh, uh, how do we intend to do this? I don't think it's a motion. So uh, is it going to be read in and uh, and then we all say I do or how? what's the proposal there? <clears throat> so we have done it in the form of a resolution. Okay. Um, previously. So um, if you can take a mover and seconder and then we'll pull it again on the 15th. Okay, thank you. So moved by Councillor Berman, seconded by Councillor Madigan. Whereas the Collingwood Community-Based Strategic Plan requires the annual reaffirmation of the Council Code of Conduct by all members of Council, therefore be it resolved that Council hearing reaffirm we have read and continue to understand and adhere to the Council Code of Conduct. All in favor. And that is carried unanimously, thank you. And that brings us to item five, which is deputations. And the first deputation is 5.1, Collingwood Judicial Inquiry, John McGarry. Sarah, can you let Mr. McGarry in, please? Yes, Your Worship. At this point, I do not see John McGarry as an attendee. If he is there, if he's able to press the raise your hand feature. All right, he should be joining us. I see him there. Hello, Mr. McGarry. How do you do, Mr. Mayor? Can you hear us? I hear you just fine, thank you. All right, we hear you loud and clear. and. So the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is John McGarry and I reside at 15 Sunset Court, Collingwood. Uh, today we're going to hear from CAO Skinner about plans for implementation of Justice Morocco's recommendations. I do sincerely commend staff on the initiative and indeed what choice do we have? We have to try to extract some value out of this massive expenditure. However, we will not hear anything about the elephant in the room. That is the colossal over $8.1 million cost of the JI, and I believe it's time we should. I want to know how it is possible that the original cost projection of 1.4 to 1.6 million laid before council by CAO and Min in staff report T2018-06, two months after the resolution passed, by the way, could have been so outrageously and monstrously wrong. I ask you if a town project, for example, a road paving or water filtration plant expansion came in at five times the initial projection, wouldn't there be serious questions asked and one hopes resignations requested and accepted? I have asked for a detailed breakdown of some of the biggest numbers in the actual cost such as a million four to Mr. McDowell's firm, Lensner Slate, a million six to Crawley McEwen Brush, and three quarters of a million to DMG Associates, etc. There is a lengthy list of large amounts paid out to various law firms and others. To date, I have not received a reply. Apparently town staff believe this to be covered under solicitor client confidentiality. I do not agree. I believe the public is entitled to know exactly how many hours were billed, by whom, and at what rate. I also want to know if the town, uh, excuse me, I also want to know if the town had any prior contract or agreement to control these billings. Was there an upset limit? Was there any RFP process imposed before the start of the JI? And if not, why not? I now know 
that there were red flashing warning lights about the cost that council was aware of as early as March, 2018. Then Deputy Mayor Saunderson appeared on the Penny Skelton TV show with Councilor Madigan on the 2nd of March, just days after the resolution passed and said that the JI would cost about a million. But in the next sentence it says that the Toronto Domi inquiry cost 17 million, Mississauga McCallion inquiry was 8 million and Waterloo's Rim inquiry was three. So how could he possibly claim that ours could cost only 1 million? He goes on to explain that on advice from solicitor William McDowell, through some mysterious process of bifurcation that we would save money. By the way, the same Mr. Madol's firm, Benzner Slate, has to date billed us $1,432,687, not including any of their billings in the period before JI was called or since its delivery. Two, on the 30th of April, 2018, CAO Farid Amin presented council a cost projection of 1.4 to 1.6 million. However, the former CAO John Brown, who had been in for, who had been involved in legal consultations with Mr. McDowell before the calling of the JI on the 30th of April warned council that CAO Amin's projection looked very low. Three, the Chief Justice of Ontario, the Honorable Heather Forster Smith, warned in a 6 April 2018 letter that costs could be high. She attached to her letter a schedule of the Mississauga inquiry, $8 million cost as a cautionary example that apparently CAO Amin never shared with council. Note that these alarm bells were ringing after the resolution was passed on the 26th of Feb, 2018. I have been unable to find any publicly available document to indicate that council ever discussed the cost before passing the resolution. In fact, nor was there ever an opportunity provided for public discussion or questions on the JI before the resolution passed. Supposedly, Deputy Mayor Saunderson provided notice of the resolution on February 12. However, this is not reflected in the minutes of the February 12 council meeting. So was there discussion of the potential for a massive cost overrun in the in-camera meeting with Mr. McDowell before the 26th February council meeting that passed the resolution? We might never know. But how is it possible that council embarked on an $8 million voyage with no apparent consideration of the cost? I would like to know how council could possibly have thought our inquiry could come in at one quarter of the cost of Mississaugas. If they were informed of the risk, did they willfully ignore the warnings? Would that constitute dereliction of duty or merely gross negligence? Either way, it has resulted in a loss to the town of six and a half million dollars of unbudgeted cost overrun. Members of the 2014 council, you should be really incensed. You passed the resolution, I guess in good faith, based on a cost projection of between one and two million per Will McDowell. Full disclosure, I also supported Mayor Saunderson's election campaign and the JI, but that was the main issue in that campaign. I accepted the projection at phase value, and I did then feel it was a great deal of money, but hoped that there would be some significant new revelation coming out of it that would justify that level of spending. And by the way, my opinion, there wasn't. So now I feel like a chump and I am simply irate that I was so badly fooled. You can't be happy either that your names are now forever linked to a 6.5 million unplanned expenditure. If I were you, I would want to know how and why I was so grossly misled. Those of you who are elected for the first time in 2018 have a different issue. Most of that 8 million was passed, was actually spent on your watch. So you got stuck with an ownership of an unplanned, unbudgeted six and a half million dollar cost overrun. You might, however, have had a chance to call a halt to this fiasco on the 10th of June, 2019, when Treasurer Leonard came to you with the news that whoops, 
the JI had already hit 2.3 million with a forecast that it could go to four. And while that projection was only $4 million low, I wonder what might have happened if you had said at that moment, that is all and not one penny more. You must be frustrated that six and a half million dollars of cost overrun is sunk, gone forever, that you have had to fund out of current tax revenue. That is a lot of money that could have been put to more productive uses like debt reduction, affordable housing units, waterfront master plan, et cetera. Instead, it's six and a half million blown, mostly on big fat lawyer bills. Doesn't that drive you crazy? I therefore ask you to pass a motion to commission an in-depth investigation by the town's integrity commissioner into the source of these low ball estimates and an airing of how it came to be that council ignored or was misled about the high cost of a massive overrun, the high risk of a massive cost overrun. I want to know the derivation of CAO amends or cost projection and whether council and Collingwood residents were willfully or deliberately misled by this woefully low ball figure, and if so, by whom? Further, I respectfully request that you order the town's outside auditor, Baker Tilly, to return a public report on value for money. Is Justice Morocco's report worth over $8 million? And I think I know the answer. Was there adequate cost control before and during the inquiry? Was there any oversight? Or did staff merely rubber stamp these massive invoices and sign the payment checks? Failing resolutions from council on these requests, I will personally ask the integrity commissioner to investigate, and I will ask my fellow Collingwood residents to join me in pressing the commissioner to do so. It is unfortunate that municipalities have no equivalent of the federal parliamentary budget officer who could take the initiative on matters like this, but perhaps our CAO could take that on as a challenge. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. A transcript of this deputation with links to the documents I've cited will be sent to councillors and press mailboxes immediately after. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGarry. I'm right in under 10 minutes. Yes, sir. Council, is there any questions or comments for Mr. McGarry on his presentation? Councillor Berman. Uh, what, first, a clarification just through you to, I guess, the clerk. Um, Mr. McGarry said something about council having the opportunity to halt the inquiry in 2019. I think he said June. Is that correct? Clerk Thomas? For your worship to Council Berman, um, it's my understanding that once the process is underway, that it cannot be halted. Um, so uh, I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Uh, okay, I didn't think so either, but I, I just I assumed John had done his uh, homework on that. Um, and then I just wanted to point out a couple things that are to John's concerns. Sorry, Mr. McGarry's concerns. Um, it, I have uh, the staff report, the April twentieth or April thirtieth, twenty eighteen staff report that I'm referring. To. Um, and when uh, when there's points taken from is it Miss Bench, the city solicitor of Mississauga. And she talks about the things that need to be understood. Um, and a couple of the things she points out is that the, I got some background noise, I hope it's not me. Um, the commissioner's decision in this respect will impact the cost and length of the inquiry. So that was stuff that uh, Justice Morocco was looking after. Uh, she also said it's very difficult to estimate potential costs of an inquiry. Uh, which is what Mr. Amin did, due to the unknowns that will impact the hearing length, any potential delays in receiving documents and materials, uh, of which there were like a half a million pages, unknown forensic audit and investigative needs, determination of the parties and witnesses, the potential for legal challenges, and many other issues that can arise. And then the last thing I want to point out is she says a time limit cannot be established by the municipality for an inquiry. So... Uh, you know, I, I've sat in the audience as maybe Mr. McGarry did when this was all presented and the staff report uh, did this based on an estimation of a nine month inquiry. But I'd like to think it was also done under the assumption that everybody that was going to fit into that nine months is going to tell the truth. Um, 
no, I don't want to get into that now, but I went through the witness lists and I'm just going to show that I've yellow highlighted them. And if you eliminate current and former town staff, which were there for context, every single person but one that testified in parts one and part two, Justice Morocco was found not to accept their evidence. So I'd like to think that if everybody had just, well, first of all, had told the truth from the get-go, we wouldn't have needed an inquiry. But if they told the truth on the stand, it probably could have been done in the time limit and for the cost that was originally estimated. That's, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Berman. Uh, Councillor Comey, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. McGarry. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm glad to hear that a copy of your uh, words are going to be shared because you cover a lot of things and I'd be interested to see the wording of the motions that you're referring to. I guess I'm further uh, intrigued by Clerk Almas's comments and I'd like to learn more about it in terms of if we're saying once the train has left the station it can't be stopped and if a public is told 1.4 to 1.6 and we end up at over eight million dollars are we saying there's really possibly no end in sight i mean it could have literally been limitless that would be hard for me to understand because that could possibly leave a town in a really bad situation so i recall when we did vote that day we were voting to further allocate money so i'm going to try to educate myself on that more because i think if anything, that furthers Mr. McGarry's comments as being incredibly concerning. Mr. McGarry used words like uh, resignation, outrageous, massive expenditure. These are words I have certainly heard from our residents and it is very frustrating to them. And as a member of this council, it's very frustrating to me. So I wanna thank you for coming today, Mr. McGarry. And I'm sorry to hear you're not getting the information you've requested. And the fact that you're here about an inquiry and talking about requesting information and not getting it is concerning me even more. So um, again, I'll look forward to receiving your comments in writing and doing some uh, follow-up on those items. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McLeod. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and, again, and also uh, my thanks to Mr. McGarry for taking what clearly was a lot of time and effort to uh, put together a report for us uh, and uh, provide it to us uh, immediately following this meeting. I just would like a little clarification on some of the dates that were mentioned, um, because I understand there was a there was a that the actual request to the Chief Justice for the Judicial Inquiry came at a particular date and uh, that the date of the estimate of the cost of the report of the inquiry came at some point afterwards um, in March and February respectively. And I just wonder if someone can sew that together for me um, at any, can anyone? on staff do that for me uh, off the top of their heads. <laughs> Thank you, I'll look to uh, either the clerk or CAO Skinner. Oh, Marjorie, okay, Marjorie Leonard, go ahead, Marjorie. Through you, your worship, the Chief Justice received the request from the town on March the 6th. We received the letter back from her on April the 6th, indicating that she had at that point named Justice Morocco as the uh, presiding commissioner for this inquiry. And at that time, she also provided a report, a uh, copy of the report that was prepared for uh, by Ms. Bench for the um, Mississauga inquiry. So any calculations or any um, uh, projections that came after that. Um, if you read that letter, she also indicated that one of the things that we should do is to request proportionality, which I know the CAO uh, Amin did do that. Um, but again, as Clerk Almas and everyone has said, once you start the judicial inquiry, you have no way out of it until the end. And it's the justice and the 
commission council that actually determine the direction of any questions and any investigation that they do. And they have the right to do significantly deeper investigations than um, a lot of other agencies out there. Thank you, Marjorie. Does that assist Councilor McLeod? It does, thank you. And Councilor Hamlin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, Mr. McGarry. I appreciated your comment. Just a few things. One, uh, if it's any assistance to Councilor McLeod, uh, because I was interested in something else on the agenda, the day I was sitting actually in council chambers, the day that uh, Mr. McDowell came out of an in-camera meeting with council and it, the motion for the judicial inquiry was read into the proceedings and voted on. Um, and that same day, um, because I was listening there, um, questions were asked about Mr. McDowell as cause. And at that time, he indicated that it could be very expensive. It could be a million dollars, but it could also be a million and a half. So uh, that was that's always been the number and the order of events that I recalled. So I just thought I would share that. Um, and I also um, wanted to say I appreciate the staff report we'll be dealing with later. Uh, has a few suggestions on these cost overruns by way of approaching the province and suggesting that there should be a way to cap these kind of proceedings uh, or scope them in some way. There's not very much or any direction, I should say, given the legislation uh, that allows a municipality to call a judicial inquiry. I think after the fact, it's easy to say, you know, because I can sit here and think of ways to cap prices by capping, you know, <laughs> uh, hourly rates, um, Rates. There's lots of ways clients cap lawyers fees, uh, but um, I think these are things that need to be discussed also perhaps at a provincial level and I'll look forward to the discussion uh, later in the agenda on this and also Mr. McGarry to uh, receiving your, your uh, written remarks. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you and I can confirm that uh, my January 4 meeting with the Attorney General those very issues came up for discussion. So talking about cost controls in the process and many of those cost controls were in fact discussed at the outset of this cost, uh, this judicial inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr. McGarry for your comments. Oh, sorry, we've got Deputy Mayor Hall. Go ahead. Sorry about that. My uh, <laughs> monitor is uh... I've cut myself off here. So anyway, I've got it figured out now. Uh, through you to uh, Mr. McGarry and, and perhaps to our next two deputants and uh, quite frankly to anyone else who uh, is interested in uh, this particular matter and uh, in accountability. Uh, first, I'm pleased that it would appear that all nine of us now around the table have uh, finally taken an interest in this matter. We may have a different opinion or a different approach, but uh, it's good to see that we're asking questions. Um, Mr. McGarry, uh, I think that you and your fellow citizens, your fellow residents, uh, which includes the nine of us, have every right to be frustrated, upset, and to have questions to ask. Um, as the only member of that council from 10 to 14, uh, I too was uh, fully supportive of the direction of the previous council in terms of uh, going through uh, with a commitment to the inquiry after numerous upon numerous upon numerous attempts from two CAOs former uh, failed to get basic questions answered. And uh, as a result, uh, it was after that that the council of the day uh, determined that they needed to, to go forward. Um, my only comment, and it would be this, and I don't think that it will appease you, Mr. McGee, and it's not to appease you, is that I truly believe that this is the first step of many more to come and that uh, we are just in the early chapters of a very very sad story and that when the final chapter is written uh, my hope is that the cost although there are questions today uh, will be justified and that there will be better answers to uh, the questions you're asking today and uh, that is perhaps unfortunately something that we will see 
uh, beyond my time on council. Uh, but uh, I do believe that at some point, this community will have the answers it deserves, will have the outcome that it intends. And I truly believe two things. One, it will be the betterment of this community and the region. And broader, if we do our job, step one was already taking place here and at the county and putting a motion forward. We will do our very best to ensure that the 306 recommendations, those that are applicable from a, an, a provincial level will um, be advanced so that they can better uh, all residents of Ontario. So thank you for your time, Mr. McGarry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there any other questions or comments, Council? No, well, thank you very much, John, for coming today. And certainly around this table, we all share the concerns about the cost. But I, as the mover of the motion, stand behind that motion. And I can tell you that probably one of the single most uh, causes of the escalation of those costs is the fact that in December of 2018, when the council came or the judicial inquiry came out with their initial schedule, they anticipated this inquiry was going to take eight months based on the fact that we've been told by many parties involved that we had all the documents relevant to this. 440,000 documents later, which consumed approximately half of the original budget. We sorted through those and uh, created, I think, 600 pages of foundation documents, which then formed the basis of eight months of hearing. The fact is that this was an extremely complicated and complex, I would say, manipulation and really victimization of our community that cost us at the time, probably eight to $10 million, but will cost us probably in the order of 20 to $30 million by the time we get down to actually having a discussion about our next recreational facilities. So the opportunity costs there, the lost income, uh, those are all massive considerations and not the least of which, as Justice Morocco in the title to this report calls the loss of public trust. When there's transparency, lack of transparency, public trust is lost. And I think your questions today feed into that because we at this council made a decision or the last council made a decision to try to eradicate the rumors and innuendo and suspicions. And you may say that those have only been confirmed. I say it's gone much farther than that. And when you consider that our budget this year was $100 million, $8 million to ensure that uh, the integrity of processes at town hall make sure that every dollar that comes in our doors is accounted for when it goes out. I think when you amortize that out over the number of years to come and the changes that we will be making uh, will be, unfortunately, it was an investment we had to make. And you can certainly uh, raise concerns with the costs, but those were estimates that we got in advance. And we were advised at the outset that once we made this step, we could not go back. And based on what we had before us at the time uh, and in the circumstances, and after all our efforts through three consultants, one consultant's report cost $40,000, only to be advised after the fact that the shared service agreement on which it was based was not valid because on July of August or July of 2012, the mayor signed a new shared services agreement, which overrode all of that. And nobody told the consultant, either from the Collis end, from the CPUSB end, or from town hall's end. So there were major, major issues. And uh, it, is, it is awful that we've had to spend this much money. And in my respect, sir, it was required. And uh, I think going forward, that will be our roadmap. And unfortunately, when you are the victim of a serious illness, it's not great policy to blame the, to blame the cure. The fact that we had to incur this judicial inquiry is a testimony to the utter disgrace that went on before then. So thank you, sir. And I'd be happy to meet with you at any time to answer any of your questions. Sarah, do we have our next deputy? Yes, your worship. And we will uh, move John McGarry back into uh, the waiting room. Our next uh, deputant is Mr. Tim Fryer, and he will be joining us via telephone. Can you hear me, Mayor Saunderson? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Fryer. Go ahead, you have good 10 afternoon. minutes. 
Okay. Um, Mayor Saunderson, members of council and staff, I appreciate the opportunity to present to you. It is significant that this comes about almost exactly three years after the initial February 12th in-camera council meeting was conducted from an agenda item simply listed as hydro share update. Only two weeks later, at another hydro share update in-camera session, the historic resolution 42-2018 must have been approved because it then was brought forward in open session for enactment. Since then, this is the only SIC meeting on the inquiry that has a formal staff report provided with the issued agenda, thereby permitting proper public engagement. Honestly, three years ago today, if a Collingwood taxpayer had told me this would happen on a multi-million dollar municipal expenditure, I would have said that is not possible. Yet that is what has happened in spite of concerns raised throughout by myself and others like former CAO Brown when he also questioned the adequacy of a $1.5 million cost projection. The communication and reporting strategy established back in February 26 in camera can only be described as extremely inadequate and a major reason for recent contentions about misinformation. The latest was the local media story citing staff stating 8.5 million was spent when it appears to be 8.125 million or is it 8.5 million? What I am generally updating you on today is what needs to be learned from your inquiry processes. Prior to the release of the November 2nd report, evaluation work was in progress. As I have previously outlined in part, it is necessary because the commissioner doesn't address or evaluate the process. Significantly though, it is also because I couldn't support that historic decision to obligate the Collingwood taxpayer to an inexplicable open-ended expenditure. My questions and concerns that I raised back then remain outstanding as well new ones have developed. Therefore, securing acceptable answers now is the course of my due diligence. I do take this very seriously, especially after what I learned from individuals that had key roles during the process, as well with what I've determined to date. It's also about what I haven't been allowed to determine for certain because unfortunately some of my queries have not been responded to or I am waiting my appeal of mostly solicitor client or vendor client privileged information. I will never understand how taxpayers have incurred what I previously submitted has direct and indirect costs in the area of $10 million for the inquiry processes. But when details are sought, we are simply cited confidentiality. Council should do something about this, but I won't dwell further about that right now. Rather, I will say for background that in 2012, when I ended my 35 years of Chief Financial Officer tenure with Collingwood Utility Services Corps, shortly after the Par PowerStream partnership transaction closed, essentially the major reason was that I couldn't support council's sale decision. It certainly wasn't compensation, as I was always believed I was very well taken care of and had worked hard to deliver exemplary service to Collingwood's electricity ratepayer and taxpayer. A major barometer of success for me had been providing council with an approved annual business plan evaluation that focused on affordability and sustainability while enhancing the most valuable saleable Collingwood asset ever owned. After the sale to PowerStream though, I was very uncertain that I would be able to deliver those same assurances to all stakeholders. Prior to the sale closing, I had voiced concern when it was required to the Collis Board and Upper Management that I needed to see a business plan that outlined how the statements that were being made to council and the public could be fulfilled. One was never produced by those who were providing the assurances. Thus my concerns and decision. I reflect about this because although I left Call as PowerStream, I still had obligations to the share stakeholders, except for PowerStream. Yes, I still had a fiduciary responsibility to my former employer, but with the support in 2014, of our taxpayers on council, I could work towards better outcome in regards to Collingwood's electricity and water utilities. While I wasn't completely satisfied with all decisions, which I will delve into some later, as I came into my final year, I was very confident that major success had been achieved with regards to electricity assets. Coming into 2018, closing the EPCOR sale, 
which I've reported on in depth to Council as being an excellent divestiture outcome in spite of the circumstances, was my top priority. If Collis didn't come to fruition, there was, to me, no doubt that it would cost Collingwood significantly. I recall that at the start of 2018, all indications were that the closing would proceed without issue, but then the February 12th in-camera session took place. That's when I was informed of what could be described as a two-year secret investigation and that a recommendation was being tabled for a public inquiry. The early indication to me, which I have now confirmed based on the responses received, was there had been inadequate work done to warrant that significant recommendation at that time. Since my decision back then was that I couldn't support an inquiry and that a no vote by me would be challenged on conflict of interest, I had to recuse myself. I know I am repeating myself to you here, but that's for full transparency. As the five councillors enacted the inquiry just two weeks after learning about the possibility, I was troubled by the reasoning that was being put forward at the council table and through local media outlets. I stated my concerns to the five at the March 8th council meeting. Paramount was that I was not aware of the major outstanding questions that were being stated regarding the Collingwood and Power Stream transaction and operations, at least any that weren't already clarified by either consultant interactions or media revelations about the OPP's determinations or for certain would be once the UPCOR sale concluded because at closing all Collis historical files and resources would be available to Council for full review. Additionally, I was troubled by the expressions of running out of time and last chance, mostly because an inquiry was going to put the UPCOR transaction at risk. This is confirmed from the ensuing showstopper demands by UPCOR that led to another side letter agreement having to be developed. It also was confusing because there was an election in just eight months, so it appeared to me that a question on the ballot was an appropriate option to consider. As I stated back then, I would have supported that process because there would have been time to do the investigative work that should be done to put a business plan together, including the cost sensitivity analysis that had been recommended. While this backgrounder may appear to some to be a roundabout way to get here to my lessons learned observations, I would submit it was necessary due to the complex nature of the matter because much of what I reviewed forms the basis of what is submitted for your consideration in the following. Time only allows for a bullet point outline and some points will be repetitive to those in the staff report, as was the case with the Commissioner's recommendations and other former inquiry results. I respectfully submit that there should be, one, additional protective restrictions put in place for the enactment of a municipal inquiry. These will help serve to reduce the loss of council oversight and control that such factors as being enacted in the year of a municipal election without a doubt cause. Two, strict adherence to all municipal policies and procedures at all times, such as completion of business plan requirements, including cost sensitivity analysis, by experienced personnel and establishing an appropriate designated funding source at the outset. Three, detailed public reporting requirements for all direct and indirect current charges. For full transparency, indirect costs such as carrying charges and municipal staff's participation should be tracked as it was supposed to be and included in all reports. Four, special council meetings prior to enactment and after the judge's report to ensure public input. The major goal would be, with full public engagement, to have no outstanding questions at the end of the process, unlike the current situation. In closing, I will outline that I have pre some of my points in the interest of meeting time requirements. Also, I will continue to attempt to obtain further confirmation on the items I consider to be outstanding. Based on those findings, I will refine my review before submitting it in written form to Council. I expect this to be in the near term because it will need to be completed as I continue to present to other municipal utilities and councils on my findings and recommendations. For instance, I am participating in a workshop next week on enhancing board governance of CEOs. You have 30 seconds, Mr. Fryer. Oh, thank you. The critique work that I will be completing is necessary based on the findings to date. I will endeavor to eliminate, but expect there will be probably still be some unanswered questions. So those and the other factors such as side letter agreement, missing BP components, reduced council oversight and control, inadequate public 
engagement, not fully adhering to policy, not considering all options, that where verifiable concerns with the first call of sales transaction also are or appear to have occurred within the judicial inquiry processes too. Common sense dictates that this should be properly reviewed and documented. That's 10 minutes, Mr. Fryer. Thank you for those comments, Mr. Fryer. Council, any comments or questions for Mr. Fryer? Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just, I know that we're going to have discussions probably for, you know, some time now on costs of this inquiry and how we could have done it better and how the province could have helped. But I, I just hope we never wade into uh, what Mr. Fryer is suggesting. I think that, you know, should we have called or should the previous council have voted in favor of a judicial inquiry? Because uh, to my mind, um, that was a very important step uh, that our town took and it was a necessary step. And the only thing I can say, you know, I could go on and on about that, but I just look around every day and I say, are the people who were running the municipality, whether at the council table or off the council table, and who were um, investigated as part of that inquiry, are they still running the show in Collingwood? And every day I look around and I say, no, they're gone. And the only reason they're gone is because there was a judicial inquiry. And I just wanted to make it clear. I hope that we don't fall into that trap of saying, well, the deal wasn't so bad or there was a lot of good things about it or because to me, the bottom line is, you know, the transparency, the accountability that we bring forward as this current council and that our professional staff offer every day uh, made it all worthwhile. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, am I responding to that? I, I don't think that was a question. I think it was a statement, Mr. Fryer, so I don't think it requires a response. Thank you. Well, I think it does. Um, I'd like to, to know kind of who Mr. Fryer? specifically we're referring Mr. to. Mr. Fryer, I'm the chair, sir. And if I uh, want a response, I will provide you with an opportunity. But I did Certainly. not see that as a question. Councillor Comey, you had your card up. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm just, uh, thank you for coming today, Mr. Fryer. I've just made a note that you're the second deputy in a row to say that you've made uh, requests for documents or information, haven't received them. So um, I don't know if you plan to share your comments with council or what those documents are or information that you're trying to get and haven't received, but um, I hope you do. I hope you do share it with us. Thank you. I'll look maybe to CAO Skinner, um, some of the requests for documentation. If you have anything to say at this point. Um, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, yes, a, a number of those documents were made, uh, requests were made under a freedom of information criteria. And I think Clerk Almas has a comment on uh, um, the regulations potentially uh, related to that and how they've been treated, the requests have been treated. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Clerk Thomas. Certainly, Your Worship. Um, there have been uh, a number of requests made through uh, Municipal Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act. And uh, that document or that piece of legislation allows um, uh, people access to information and it also protects privacy. There is a number of documents that have been requested that actually do not meet um, the merits of release and uh, those are going through uh, the IPC process. Thank you, Claire Thomas. Councillor Berman. Uh, thank you. Just just popped into my head uh, to quickly support uh, what the clerk just said. Is uh, she might remember that uh, I had filed a couple of FOIs uh, last term that she had approved, um, giving me the information, and the person that had the information challenged it through the IPC, and she's nodding in agreement. And the IPC sided with that the clerk had done it properly each time, and I uh, I ended up getting the information. Thank you. Councillor McLeod. 
Thank you. And uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to uh, either the clerk or the CAA or, or maybe even the treasurer, I'm not entirely sure. I, I'm, I'm curious to know, while we're talking about money and estimates and what things cost, um, we've heard from um, Mr. Fryer several times now on our consent agendas, and, uh, and apparently there are many uh, FOIs uh, that have been filed. Do we have a rough estimate of how much um, uh, Mr. Fryer's uh, requests and queries have now cost us in, with regard to staff time, or is that something that is even necessarily uh, something that we keep track of individual FOIs, et cetera? Uh, through you to, uh, or sorry, Claire Thomas or CAO, who would like to take that question? Certainly, I, I can feel this, and, and if the CAO uh, would like to add any further, there definitely is, and, and further to the council motion supported at the last council meeting regarding, you know, in uh, uh, abuse of uh, freedom of information um, policies, we're not able to capture the cost for um, undertaking reviews necessary in, in the production of information, um, so we do not have a detailed um, uh, estimate on the amount of time spent on specific inquiries, um, but it has been substantial. Thank you. Any follow up, Councillor McLeod? I, I believe the CAO has her hand up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, uh, CAO Skinner. Thank you, Your Worship. I don't have my card with me, so I'm a little less noticeable. Thank you. Um, through you to Councillor McLeod as well. I think, though, uh, while we're looking at freedom of information in the municipal context, it is very important to say that we've been through this judicial inquiry in part to make sure that information is freely shared, appropriate information is freely shared. And uh, for the clerk and myself and all the staff, um, any uh, freedom of information request that is received, we do our best to um, search all the documents, uh, to release all of those that are appropriate and to provide a professional um, set of opinions um, to the IPC or others that are necessary. So I wouldn't want any of this conversation to be a discouraging of um, true requests for information uh, to the to municipal sources because I think that is 100% in line with the intentions of this council and also with staff, of course. Sorry, I probably didn't need to say those words, but I think it's important just to have them on the record during uh, during our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, CEO Skinner, and that's absolutely correct. We want to be disclosing all documents that our residents are entitled to. Council, are there any other questions or comments for Mr. Fryer? Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Mr. Fryer, you were the CFO of, uh, of Collis Companies uh, between 2000 and 2012. Sorry, Mayor your Anderson, I did not hear that because it was letting me know I needed to um, mute or unmute to come in. Okay, I'll rephrase, I'll restate the question. I was just asking you, Mr. Fryer, you were the CFO at the Collis Companies between uh, 2000 and 2012? Yes, I was. And you spoke in your comments today about obligations to shareholders. And I'm just wondering if you can tell us uh, uh, how many occasions did you disclose the management salaries at the wholly owned Collis, uh, Collis companies to the town of Collingwood, the 100% shareholder during uh, your tenure as CFO? As you know, I, I did not disclose it. It would be against my fiduciary responsibility to the employer. So you just talked about your obligations to the shareholders and we got a legal opinion during the last term of council when we had these same issues with our partner power stream about getting those salaries disclosed and the legal opinion we received is that the shareholders are entitled to those information, whether or not we disclose it as a sunshine list is another issue altogether. Would you not agree with me that the 100% shareholder is entitled to know the cost of its management staff? I agree. Um, and I was not at our stream when, when that uh, legal opinion was received and the shareholder was asking for it. Um, and I can say now, because the, I do not have the fiduciary responsibility that I had when Collis was existing, um, I can say that I recommended many times that that information be shared handily the same way it has been in other utilities, such as um, Windsor, um, disclosed regularly. Um, doesn't matter if they were OBCA companies or not, they disclosed. That was never done during your tenure. And would you agree with me that that was one of the major issues 
when we were trying to find out the cost uh, shared services agreement and the cost effectiveness, we were not able to find out any disclosure about the salaries and costs of the employees' benefits, bonuses, or third-party contracts with the, with the call list company. That's with? correct. When when um, it was being requested, it was being refused to uh, still to come over. Um, that information wouldn't be available until after the upcourt transaction closed. That was never provided during your tenure, and you'd agree with me that it was an issue when we were looking at all of these materials during the four years between 2014 and 2018. Okay, so just to be clear, you're talking about 2014 to 2018, and I was not at Collis at that point in time. Um, when I was at Collis, prior to the um, sale transaction, it was never directly requested by the um, municipality. That's not what I've heard, but uh, we'll go with that. But, sir, you sat at the council table for four years, yes? Yes, I did. And did you ever provide any information about the 20, 2000 to 2012 period of time? Because you knew we were looking for that as well. Yes, I, uh, during in-camera sessions, I shared things. Um, but I did as well um, offer to possibly get more in-depth with the, with the consultants. And at that point in time, council advised me to, to not act that way, to act as a counselor. But you never provided any information about salaries or bonuses or third-party contracts between 2000 and 2012 while you sat on council? Sorry, from 2000 to 2012? Yes. I'm, I'm, you're confusing me with... So, so when I sat on council, I was not working at the utility. But you didn't provide us any... So I wouldn't be the one disclosing that information. That would be coming from the people that worked at the utility. Mr. Fryer, you just told us today that your NDA didn't bind you now, and yet when the four years you sat on council, you didn't tell us any information about the services, the contracts, the management fees, the bonuses that were paid from 2000 to 2012, and yet you knew that was an issue. And you talked today about your obligations to the shareholders and your obligations to the residents of Collingwood. And we didn't get recall information from you, sir. And then when the judicial inquiry is struck, you applied for standing. And the test for standing, and I've explained whether, myself. sir, let me finish my question, please. The test for standing is whether or not a witness has relevant information that would be of assistance to the commission. Yes? Yes. You so, sat here for four years and said nothing. And when the judicial inquiry is struck, you applied for standing. Can you explain to the residents, while they had to pay legal fees, to hear you tell them what you could have told us for four years? I completely disagree that I told you what I could tell you. I did definitely do that. I offered to do more, and I was told by counsel not to be involved. I was a counselor. Okay, well, one last question. So at you, this sir. stage, I think it's best if you do have that intriguing question that you want me to answer, certainly put it in writing. I will gladly respond to counsel. Well, let's do it here. We know that from 20, 2000 to 2012, the call this companies paid no dividend to the town of Collingwood. Can you tell me in which of those years bonuses were paid out to management staff while the town of Collingwood received no dividends? The, again, a very intriguing question, and I would appreciate to have received that in writing, and I will respond to you in writing. I'm sure our residents will be very interested. Thank you, yes. sir. Thank you. All right, Sarah, do we have our next deputant? Yes, Your Worship, Mr. Paul Ireland, and we'll let him join now. All right, Mr. Ireland should be present if you're able to um, turn on your video, if available, and unmute yourself. Good afternoon, Mr. Ireland. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. I can yep. hear you. We can okay. hear you. Go ahead, sir, please. Okay. Um, first of all, good afternoon, Mayor Saunderson, all councillors, CAO Skinner, and Clerk Almas. My name is Paul Ireland, and I am a resident of Collingwood. I wish to thank you for granting me this time to express my concerns regarding the cost overrun for the recent judicial inquiry. 
Uh, let me start, though, by saying that there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that a judicial inquiry was the order of the day when given the green light back in 2018. The estimates seem quite reasonable since the inquiry would make public the, the misconduct of previous town officials related to the uh, Hydro One's offer of 3.85 million, more than the PowerStream offer for the COLA shares, fundamentally leaving $3 million on the table. And secondly, paying close to $14 million for $14 million for Centennial Aquatic Center and the Central Park Arena, both of which have uh, were equipped with fabric men membrane structures built by BLT construction. And I recall uh, doing some of my research, it's not included in my document here, but I did Google uh, fabric membrane and, uh, structures and found on the first page of Google that there were 10 companies that made them. Yet there was a comment that was made somewhere along the line, I think it was by BLT construction or perhaps the, um, uh, the consultant that was involved that, uh, that this was a sole source product and nobody else had, had it. Anyway, uh, notwithstanding that, so then I read, I read the executive summary for the inquiry and for me, it reads like a John Grisham novel. Uh, you're supposed to laugh at that. So, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, so no question that the judicial inquiry was justified for, from a purely financial perspective and worth the expenditure of the budgeted amount. Um, however, there is one other relevant question indirectly related to the cost of this inquiry. And a provincial police completed their investigation in a timely manner. And the Collingwood Four, as I have named them, Cooper, Lloyd, Houghton, and Bonwick, been dealt with accordingly. Could the judicial inquiry have been avoided or at the very least abbreviated? Perhaps we'll never know the answer to that question. Um, and and in, in, in addition to that, um, I noted that Deputy Mayor Keith Hall has called upon the OPP to come forward with a conclusive statement and quotation marks regarding their investigation into the share sale and the spring slash BLT uh, contract with the town. <coughs> Excuse me. The OPP investigation has been going on for several years and, it, and it's only appropriate that the town insist on a near time deadline for the release of their findings. Uh, that, that one I just don't get. I mean, how many years does it take to uh, conduct a, a, you know, an investigation? And I know it was a complex situation, but nonetheless, this is now about eight years old. Um, and earlier in 2018, getting back to the, the budget uh, concern, during an interview on the Penny Skelton show, then Deputy Mayor Brian Sanderson was quoted as saying the inquiry was going to cost at least one million. Uh, I'm not quite sure if this, this specific part is accurate, but I believe that was later on that the town CAO was quoted as saying the inquiry was going to cost between 1.3 and 1.6 million dollars. However, there are questions to be asked that haven't been answered as follows. First of all, number one, how was the budget or estimate, if you prefer, of 1.3 to 1.6 million quantified? I noted that several members of the Inqu inquiry council had prior experience with these types of procedures. However, did anyone ask what to expect time and expense wise? Um, question two, 2A, who created this budget and what were he or she's qualifications? 2B, did he or she have previous experience with budgeting this type of expenditure? 2C, was there a breakdown provided of where this money would be going? For example, Justice Morocco's fees, the inquiry council fees, administrative costs, travel expense, et cetera. What were the estimated legal fees and were the chosen members of the inquiry council contacted to provide time estimates and hourly rates before it began? <coughs> Excuse me. 
why were eight lawyers required for this inquiry and all from the Toronto area? Couldn't they have hired locally qualified counsel at more reasonable rates? Maybe that's not an appropriate question, but I, it's asked and, and nonetheless. Um, please ask yourselves, uh, council members and Mayor Saunderson, why is this information important? You've all been quoted as saying, and I am paraphrasing at this point, that it is of vital importance that the community at large regain their trust in the integrity of the mayor's office and the town council going forward. And believe me, I feel for this whole group here. Um, you've in, you inherited a nightmare. And uh, what are the final totals for the cost of this inquiry and what will the residents of Collingwood have to give up to make up for the $6.5 million cost overrun? I haven't heard anybody ask that question yet, but it's 6.5 million out the door and uh, how do you replace that? What precautions will be taken to ensure this never happens again? I'll answer my own question. Of the 300 plus recommendations provided in the inquiry report, a significant number of the changes will have to be made at the provincial level, specifically in reference to the Municipal Act, um, the, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and uh, they have been recommended in previous judicial inquiries, but have yet to be incorporated into the acts. So it, it, yes, it is beyond your control, um, but I think the mayor and council should take an active role leading the uh, other municipalities in pursuit of these important updates. Um, I noted that later on today's schedule, I'm being interfered with here. I noted that, that later on today's schedule, um, sta under staff report 7.2. Phase one, uh, the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry next steps will be discussed. Will the mayor and council have a plan to enact the recommended bylaw changes that were part of these 300 recommendations? And I, and I, I really think for credibility's perspective, we need a deadline on that. So um, uh, I'm hoping we can, we can hear those answers subsequently. Uh, 2E, the Collingwood Code of Conduct for council members is now managed by an account, uh, accountability officer. It is my sincere hope that this person will ask for accountability with regard to the ju judicial inquiry expenses, specifically how the budget was created the resulting cost overrun of approximately $6.5 million and provide a published explanation of same. And 2F, as I review the attached list of expenses, I really believe there are another 100 questions that could be asked and answered. I've highlighted the expenses in question. I would like to know who authorized them. And some of them are as simple as a $421 dinner and other ones are, of course, the, the major, most major expense, and that was um, uh, the legal phase. In closing, the residents of, Con of Collingwood want nothing more than a fiscally responsible town council managing our expenditures. And I don't think that that is too much to ask. Um, I, uh, I believe that I have approximately three minutes left, uh, left to answer any questions you may have. And I want to personally thank all of you here today for your time and attention to these concerns. Thank you very much, Mr. Island, for those comments. Lots of good questions. Um, Councillor Berman. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Um, through you to Mr. Ireland, that was excellent. And the videotape replay will show that I personally laughed on your John Grisham reference. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that you feel that the uh, uh, J.I. was justified. Uh, I do. I've often said I wish I was on the council that voted for it. Um, you made a point about, uh, or, or speculation, I guess, about whether the, had the OPP uh, come to a conclusion before the vote, would it have uh, possibly abbreviated the cost? And I think that's a really good point that we'll unfortunately never know. Um, but I also think that, and I, I said this even earlier in this meeting, had the um, key figures in the judicial inquiry simply handed over the documents that they were asked for or told the truth from the onset, that would have greatly abbreviated the, uh, the cost and, and even the need for the JI. 
Um, I've got your, uh, the letter you sent to council on December 16th, um, and you make some great points in there, and you say, uh, I'm appalled that there seems to be no desire or sense of urgency on the council, and I hope we've changed your mind on that um, with the staff report and the number of things that'll come. Uh, uh, I agree in going the other direction. I would be appalled if there wasn't a sense of urgency on this council as a whole to, uh, to pursue this further. I agree with you that the public has every right to know, uh, in general, everything that they're allowed to know by law. Um, I think Think, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to uh, Mr. McGarry's presentation and questions when he was on, but I, I think, did. I think we, uh, thank you. I, I think we did address some of what you said about um, uh, the, uh, the reason for the cost estimations and why they got out of control. Uh, the agenda that guided Justice Morocco was all in there, uh, the process. Um, and uh, so on and so forth. I love that you said this was our money. I don't want people to forget that. Um, not just in the cost of the judicial inquiry, but in the much larger number of how much the town lost out on, on what led to the judicial inquiry. Um, I hope you're right about the hundreds and hopefully thousands of people that are concerned, um, but you do mention later on, and a number of people have about the need for, uh, or, or the potential need for a big public meeting. And uh, I think most of us would agree. Um, unfortunately, we're in a pandemic. And as you look at all of the squares on the screen, uh, I'd like to think it would just be chaotic to try to do it in a Zoom setting. Um, but I don't think that there's anyone that would disagree that, uh, you know, once this is over, or, you know, whatever, given the opportunity, we would be happy to reiterate uh, and add to the facts that we know. And uh, overall, I, I thought all your points were excellent. I, uh, I don't know if you're aware, I did, uh, the on December 16th, I did pull your uh, your letter to, just to make a point, it had nothing to do with your letter. It was about the, uh, uh, the public comment being buried in a meeting and it had nothing to do with you, if you were aware of that, it's to do with something I'm gonna talk about in a couple of weeks. Uh, but I'm glad that a mere two weeks later, you're here in front of us because you made excellent points. Thank you. Well, I, I'm learning. Uh, I'm learning as I go here. I'm. Uh, I came to Collingwood three years ago. Uh, I'd never been involved in political affairs before, but when I when this uh, started to come to light, I decided that it was time to, uh, you know, get involved. And I'm trying to do it as positively as possible. Um, although, I do have some concerns about the procedures more than anything in terms of how. Uh, the, how a number is established. Where did you go to get the information? The, the, were you, for example, able to talk to those um, uh, people on, on the on the uh, the council inquiry before putting a budget number together? I, I'm I'm a former almost retired businessman, and I look at at this and I say I I I'm I find it incredible that just some of those questions were not asked. And, uh, and perhaps you weren't in a position to ask them. I don't know, that's what I, I came to find out today. But, uh, the, you know, serious cost overrun here and, and uh, it does hurt the residents of Collingwood and uh, we need to make it up somehow, some way. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councilor Berman? Uh, yeah, if I may, Mayor Saunderson, uh, yeah. you're, the reason that uh, you got into it is the same reason I got into this eight and a half years ago, and look where I am. So I don't wish this on you, but uh, please don't stop. Uh, this is what it takes. So so thank you for uh, for what you've done to look into this. You're welcome, sir. Council, any other questions or comments? Councilor Madigan. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Saunderson, and thank you for everyone that came today. Uh, it's interesting, in the first uh, presentation to Council, uh, Mayor Saunderson and, and my name was shared with a, the show on Penny Skelton, and I can remember that show and, and how I felt, at least, that we had no choice. Um, things have been brought up today about the cost, and it's no doubt in my mind that if people did tell the truth and gave the information moving along, we wouldn't have to do this if the council that I sat on last term got the questions answered that they were asking rather than a classic document dump at the end to try to hide uh, behind massive amounts of information that we were just asking for, we would have had to do this. Uh, the first presenter, Mr. McGarry, said that he um, felt sorry or had empathy for this council uh, being stuck with ownership of this. 
And I want to take that further. Uh, I believe last council uh, had no option other than to do this because we had the ownership of being having years of improprieties done in our town. And to justify the cost saying it's too much is kind of like a Monday morning saying, uh, you should have passed to this guy, he was open, or you should have passed to this guy, he was open. Uh, it, it's here, we have to do it. Um, and it's interesting, our second presenter um, mentioned confidentiality agreements. Uh, and I too uh, was very frustrated in my four years on council of people hiding behind confidential agreements that weren't worth the paper they were printed on. But all that being said, I believe moving forward, this council, this council today, nothing from the past today, uh, as council, we need to show the town that there will be some accountability uh, from the past councils and that we can move forward in a positive direction. Uh, we can argue this point from it all over how much it costs, but we must focus on the future and continuing to make the town that we all live, work and play in the best place in Ontario. So uh, thank you very much for everybody that voted for it. Thank you very much for Deputy Hull for sitting on that council that was being investigated and thank you for being the lone voice on that council deputy hall that stuck up for the people of Collingwood. Nobody said that and I'll say it now. Thank you so much, sir. And hopefully the nine of us can move forward in a positive direction. Thank you very much, Mayor Saunderson. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Councillor Madigan. Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Saunderson and through to Mr. Ireland. I just, I didn't want to, to leave anyone hanging thinking that the council of that day that, that made that decision to proceed did not do um, full diligence with respect to the cost <clears throat> of information that was available at the time. Uh, we did a very uh, in-depth review of what would be contained within the scope of the inquiry with the best intentions of restricting it as best we could. And I think my colleagues have spoken very well to all the things that took it beyond what we could even have imagined. But in the beginning, we did spend a lot of time uh, focusing on trying to keep the costs as minimal as we could and fully believing them to be able to land between one and one and a half million, potentially maybe two at tops based on um, the restricted scope that we submitted. But there's all the other things that that happened after that went beyond that. But we did work uh, very hard at it and we took it very seriously and, and we didn't go in with uh, eyes closed. I think we did the best we could with the information we had at the time. So appreciate uh, everyone today who took the time to come and speak to us about the, the JI and I too look forward to the next steps and um, our accountability to the public on their money that was spent. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Any other comments or questions for Mr. Ireland Council? Seeing none, uh, I just thought, oh, go ahead, Councillor McLeod. Sorry, I just, I want to reiterate as well what um, uh, the, what Councillor Jeffrey had to say, and also uh, perhaps to direct um, Mr. Ireland to page 250 of the report. I'm sorry, I'm hearing a, um, a, a rebound or um, reverb. Um, to direct uh, Mr. Ireland to uh, page 250 of the report uh, of volume two, I think, of the report, wherein it talks about the, um, the CEP USB and the, and the report that was uh, created about how $700,000 a year would be saved were that organization not to have existed. And that organization does no longer exist. And so the questions that were asked prior to the judicial inquiry beginning um, were what, and the fact that they got unanswered um, is what led to the inquiry. And so in addition to reading the executive summary, I, as daunting as it is, I recommend reading the entire thing uh, because uh, John Grisham uh, certainly uh, appears to have hand to ha had a hand in it. It's definitely a caper. And um, I, but particularly that page, um, that was where my mind got blown. And so when you think that the CPUSB existed for 11 years at $700,000 a year being flushed into the abyss, um, we may have, and that would have continued were we not to have done what we did as a town, uh, we may end up actually coming out way ahead. But thank you for coming today. We really appreciate your thoughts. Thank you.
I muted myself to cut back on the reverb and then I just was talking to myself. So uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Island. And I did want, before you go, just to put a question through to CAO Skinner or Clerk Almas. A number of our deputants today have talked about submitting questions and I'm just wondering uh, if we can uh, talk about the plan to respond to those questions. I'll turn it over, uh, Your Worship, first to Clerk Almost to talk about the uh, uh, process, and then, if necessary, just uh, talk at the end. Thanks. Thank you. Sarah? Certainly. Thank you, Your Worship. I know that um, I, I believe maybe all of our presenters had um, further speaking notes. So, again, um, if you're able to submit those. Um, as we go out to for further public consultation on all the various components that uh, were contained in the inquiry, as well as uh, the proposed review of the JI process itself, I think those questions will be very valuable. Um, so we will be facilitating uh, uh, virtual meetings. We will be um, doing a engage calling which page, which is our uh, engagement. Um, link is on Collingwood.ca website. So we encourage all the feedback um, to come through those channels. We will be um, widely publicizing um, these public engagement opportunities. So uh, stay tuned. But um, all these questions, um, we've all wrote down as much as we could today. But uh, again, if you're able to submit some further comments um, that we have on file, that would be great. Just to be clear then for our deputants, uh, their questions are heard. We are recording those questions and we are doing our best to respond to all of those questions uh, to the fullest extent that we can. Right. Correct. Good, thank you, Sarah. Mr. Ireland, thank you very much for taking time today and for your input on this. And thank you for having me and listening to my concerns. Have a good afternoon and uh, Clerk Almas, uh, we have our fourth deputant, uh, Rosalind Morrison, and I think Councillor Hamlin, you were going to uh, step out for this one. So thank you. <clears throat> All right, Your Worship, Rosalind is joining us. Perfect. Rosalind, how are you this afternoon? I'm fine. And uh, I just have to say to all of you, uh, thank you for the work you do. It's not easy. <laughs> um, should I just dive in? Yes, please go ahead. And uh, uh, you've got 10 minutes, so I'm starting the clock now. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much for the time uh, that I have with you today. I'm Rosalind Morrison. Uh, I am chair of the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay, which is a fledgling nonprofit organization. Uh, we are building a group of active volunteers and we do not have any paid staff. Um, over the last two years, uh, we've really gained traction through our programming and I'd like to thank the town of Collingwood for the support that we received for last year's online discussion series called Mapping Our Road to Recovery. Today, on behalf of the Institute, I'm requesting partnership support for our next series, uh, which builds on the future, and it's called Our Sustainable Future. It also builds on the outcomes from our last series, and it aligns with the outcomes and aspirations that the UN Habitat and Towns Collingwood World Summit uh, was able to write down in 38 resolution items uh, from the important summit held last September. So I'd like to share a slide deck with you that gives you a little bit of background on the Institute. Uh, also uh, lets you know about the outcomes from the Mapping Our Road to Recovery series and how that builds into the request that you see today for our sustainable future. Um, is someone going to be um, uh, moving a slide deck? Yes. yes. I think so, yeah. Lovely, thank you. Well, as you can see on the first slide here, this is the vision of the Institute, which is all about harnessing the power of people in place. It's really about how do we grow a balanced uh, prosperity agenda and become the smartest, greenest, healthiest, and most caring uh, region in Ontario. Next slide, please. 
You can see that there are six municipalities across Southern Georgian Bay, and there's a lot of talent and knowledge in this area. We also expand our reach right up to Owen Sound and right across to Midland uh, and Victoria Harbour to engage as many people as possible in trying to define what our future will be and how we're going to get there together. Next slide, please. Uh, most of us love being here because of this beautiful place we call Southern Georgian Bay. We have the escarpment, which is a biosphere. We have the wonderful Georgian Bay. We have all of the beautiful Four Seasons uh, lifestyle um, that's offered, and we have an incredible uh, productive agricultural base. Next slide, please. What we've been noticing though, is that we could uh, progress most, more quickly into a sustainable future if we were able to connect things. And really the Institute is about connecting, about knowledge sharing and encouraging more collaboration across sectors across the region. Next slide. How do we do that? Well, we develop programming where we are going to um, bring people together for discussions as we did with last year's mapping series. Uh, we look at a holistic view of things um, and we, currently we have five interconnected priority areas, including arts and culture, business and innovation, social justice, health and well-being, and the environment. So we wanna connect people, we wanna share knowledge, and we wanna foster collaboration. Next slide, please. Mapping our road to recovery was able to attract over 200 participants from across the region. We had support from three municipalities and a leading creative industries business. And four outcomes that were developed by those 200 participants are now being worked on by design teams and study groups. The topics that you see there feed into what we're going to be uh, talking about in terms of our sustainable future as well. It's really looking at things differently through social innovation. It's facing the future in a variety of sectors, including the arts. It's looking at strategic investments and how do we work collectively across sectors to do that. And the outcome is looking for a more resilient, inclusive and sustainable future. So those four outcomes are now being worked upon that you see on the slide. A couple of strategies, continuing the regional discussion platform and our sustainable future will be the topic for that platform. And most importantly, what are the key data points that we can all agree upon to measure progress? The final report for mapping our road to recovery is on our website at www.tisgb.com. Next slide, please. So our sustainable future, get inspired, get informed, get to work. This is going to be a collaborative seven part online discussion series and it starts in nine days on February 10th at 4.30. We're going to hold the events on Wednesdays, 4.30 to 6 p.m. I hope you're all subscribed to the Institute's uh, newsletter, which again, you can do on our homepage on the website. And really throughout our mapping series, we built a strong commitment to building back better through this pandemic and beyond. People are hoping that our future can be and will be created in a much more uh, equitable fashion and sustainable fashion. So the goal for our sustainable future is to ignite a regional sustainability vision and facilitate the development of a guiding roadmap. Next slide, please. The opportunity we have is to build on the recent UN Habitat and Towns Collingwood World Summit held last year. We have a timely opportunity to learn together more about Canada's commitment to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs and how to create an integrated, resilient and equitable transformation towards sustainability. Collingwood uh, Summit focused on the SDG Goal 11 sustainable cities and communities. And there's a link there if you wanna learn more about the SDGs. They're really based on the recognition that we must approach our issues and planning for the future in a holistic way. Milestones for goal 11 address housing, environmental and transportation challenges, integrated planning and management, protecting cultural and natural heritage, 
providing universal access to green and public space and supporting positive economic, social and environmental links between urban and rural. Next slide, please. So towards summit 2021, the town of Collingwood is committed to holding an annual summit and we believe this is where we can offer our help. In our sustainable future, speakers and participants will discuss the impacts of COVID-19 and building back better, emerging sustainable economies, chronic pressing issues, livelihoods and lifestyles, municipal finance and new investment opportunities, more community engagement and aligning objectives and data measurement through a new data index. We're going to be presenting case studies of sustainability initiatives to be shared and discussed. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of this sustainability series? Well, first and foremost, we want to respond to what residents are saying through this pandemic. We want to connect with communities that support long-term planning with proven results, find new ways to build capacities in the major sectors to achieve the goals in Sustainable Development Goal 11. We want to hear from access to capital experts about how we can together build the next economy. Let's explore collaborative models for linking innovative towns and districts. Let's learn the latest findings, key terminology, local to global initiatives, gain knowledge on regulatory requirements, and let's inspire all of us to take action. We believe that Southern Georgian Bay can meet today's needs of the planet, its people, and economic vitality without compromising the needs of future generations. Next slide, please. It begins on Wednesday, February 10th, 4.30 to 6 p.m. with the event, Why? Why Build a Case for Sustainable Future? The speakers uh, will include the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Elizabeth Dowdswell, the Mayor of Collingwood, Brian Saunderson, the CAO of Collingwood, Sonia Skinner, and the CAO of the Blue Mountains, Sean Everett. We wanna make sure that we have an active and uh, interactive uh, community session. So that the community can discuss if we had a sustainable future, what would those elements be? What data points should we be tracking towards achieving success? Follow-up events, one a month, would include the CAOs from across the region speaking about pressing issues, next economy leaders highlighting success stories, mayors from across the region highlighting assets already in place and funding challenges. And then we'll discuss integrated planning to address the SDGs in other jurisdictions so we can learn more. Next slide, please. Really, I think through Mapping Our Road to Recovery, we're compelled by the issues being surfaced to focus on building collaborative efforts towards a sustainable future for generations to come. We can look at the next generation and we have to ask ourselves, if we don't do this now, when? So we're requesting $2,500 in partnership support for this series to match the Institute's financial commitment. Thank you all for your consideration of creating a better future and for supporting and becoming a partner in our sustainable future. Thank you, Rosalind. Council, are there any questions for Ms. Morrison today? Go ahead, Councilor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Rosalind, for that presentation. Um, you have indeed done a great deal of work and your uh, seminars have been thought provoking and so well-timed considering all that we're exposed to and going through these days uh, between growth and a pandemic. I'm wondering um, regarding the request to our community for $2,500 in support, will you be approaching any other communities for um, uh, cash support for this presentation? Indeed, we will be, and we have. Uh, we're already in discussion with the Blue Mountains, and we'll be reaching out to the other municipalities in our region. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Seeing none, thank you very much, Rosalind, for taking time this afternoon and for all the work that the Institute is doing. It's uh, very much appreciated. And thank certainly you all. starting an important discussion. Great.
All right, Council, that brings us then to the consent agenda, and that's item six. And uh, I'll read the motion. It's uh, well, and, and then I'll ask for a mover and a seconder. The Council here and receive the general consent agenda and further that the information and opinions provided in the con general consent agenda items are that of the authors and are not verified or approved as being correct. 6.1, Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, building a strong foundation for success, reducing poverty in Ontario. 6.2, Ministry of Charlton and DAC insurance rates. Uh, 6.3, Ministry, or municipality, I should have said on 6.2. 6.3 is Municipality of Mississippi Mills, a uh, letter to Minister Clark, re revisions to municipal elections. And 6.4, Township of Matuan, support for Town of Plimpton, Wyoming, re extension deadlines. And I'm reading from the wrong agenda because I had there's another to 6.5. And the 6.5 is the addition to today's agenda. It's uh, Andrew Siegwert, letter re ski industry uh, working group and request for letter of support, January 29, 2021. So I'll look for a mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Jeffrey and seconded by Councillor Berman. No, you're not moving, Councillor Jeffrey? Well, I just, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to ask, I was thinking about having the 6.5 severed out. Yes. Okay, yep, we can do that. Uh, let's get it on the floor and then we'll sever it out. So if I can get a mover and a seconder, please, Councillor Berman and Councillor Doherty, I've got a request to sever 6.5. So I'm going to call the vote, unless somebody wants to pull something for direction as opposed to just a comment. Uh, seeing none, I'm gonna call the vote then on receiving item 6.1 through 6.4, all in favor. That is carried unanimously. Are there any items, uh, Council, that you would like to pull of, of those first four? Uh, go ahead, Councillor oh. Doherty. Sorry, my apologies. It was item five that I wanted to pull. Okay. All right. So Councillor Jeffrey has now left. Uh, so I will call, uh, get a motion first to receive it, and then you can pull it. So a motion to uh, receive item 6.5, moved by Councillor Berman and seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All in favor. And that is carried. And Councillor Doherty wanted to pull item 6.5. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this, uh, this is a very important initiative. The ski industry represents tens of thousands of jobs in Ontario. And um, while other outdoor facilities and recreation opportunities have been open uh, during our lockdown period, the industry has not been. Uh, and I would like to propose to the Council that we support the request from um, the uh, Ontario Ski Working Group uh, and um, uh, send a message to the province uh, to ask that the resorts be permitted to open. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm making a um, notice of motion and I can read in the motion uh, if uh, you so wish. Yes, go ahead and read in the motion and then we'll deal with it on the meeting of February 16th. Okay, thank you. Uh, whereas health professionals of all levels of government encourage Canadians to seek physically distanced outdoor exercise for both physical and mental well being, and whereas many outdoor recreation facilities have been permitted to remain open during this period of lockdown, including skating rinks, trails, and cross country ski facilities. And whereas all other ski resorts have been committed to operate in Canada and internationally, with the exception of those in Ontario, without uh, deleterious effects, and whereas the ski industry has developed rigorous protocols for safe operations during the pandemic, and whereas ski resorts employ thousands of workers, including over 1,000 jobs just here in South Georgian Bay, Therefore, the Council of the Town of Collingwood calls on the province of Ontario to support the request of the Ontario Ski Industry Working Group to be included as an outdoor recreational amenity as part of stage one or the gray regulations, uh, that is Ontario Regulation 82-20 to permit the ski hills to reopen in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So we will be dealing with that on the meeting of February 16. 
And that brings us then to item seven staff reports and item 7.1 C2021-1 annual board and advisory committee report. And I think Clerk Almas, you're gonna take us through that. Thank you, your worship. Um, and through to all the members of the committee. Firstly, I'd like to thank all of our chairs as they will be presenting their various uh, components of this report. So I thank you for your patience. Uh, as uh, you're, you were able to watch uh, our deputations uh, uh, this afternoon, I guess uh, it gives you a greater understanding of, of all the corporate issues that are going on as you focus on the very important uh, work that uh, you provide guidance to council on uh, throughout uh, the year. So I will ask us the uh, presentation to come forward as we call in all of our chairs um, of the various committees and boards, and I will provide a brief intro, and then I will invite each chair to speak to their piece. So next slide. So this annual report is a requirement of our community-based strategic plan. So under the goal, transparent and accountable local government, we have the objective of, of enhancing public trust. And as such, we are able to present uh, this year a detailed uh, report on the initiatives and achievements they've had over the past year, as well as their priorities going forward and how they align with our strategic priorities. Next slide. So in 2020, Council oversaw eight advisory committees and boards. COVID-19 meant significant challenges, including a two-month break in April, March and April to move to virtual meetings and realign priorities. Our committee and board members rose the occasion to accomplish many of their priorities and much more. So I do appreciate um, all of their dedication. Uh, ironically, uh, I had a chance to quickly go back and take a look at attendance. And one thing that was uh, definitely a benefit having virtual meetings, we were able to see a, a higher uh, attendance uh, at a lot of our committees and boards. So that's uh, an interesting fact. As much as we all like to be together in person, um, there has been you know, some, uh, some uh, positives. So we'll go to our first committee and we will ask Margaret Adolph to present on behalf of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Over to you, Margaret. Yes. Good afternoon, <clears throat> uh, Mayor Saunderson, Deputy Hull, uh, members of Council, CAO uh, Skinner, Clerk Almas, and guests. Thanks for the opportunity to speak regarding the workings and accomplishment of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. As you know, we're guided by the AODA Accessibility Act. Accessibility of Ontarians with Disability Act 2005, with goals to be met by 2025. Uh, the three main activities of the Accessibility Advisory Committee are to advise Council about the requirements and implementation of accessibility standards, the preparation of accessibility reports, and other matters in which Council may seek its advice. Review site plans under Section 41 of the Planning Act and perform functions that are specified in the regulations. So we try and do our best, uh, and I think we have. It's, been, it's certainly my opinion that Collingwood has done a great job regarding accessibility. Cannot begin to name all the improvements that have been made in the last 10 to 15 years. And uh, I've been around for that, those many years. The Accessibility Committee consists of seven members, and uh, besides me, there's Heather Grassman, Vice Chair, Martina Ernst, Vanessa McDonald, Cheryl Ann Manahan, Robin Sheldon, Ro Rosalind Steele, and our staff resources. Jennifer Park, Coordinator of Community Wellbeing, Stephanie Hawkins, Committee Secretary, and last but not least, Sarah Almas, Clerk. Thanks to, for all your good work. So we're gonna look at the 2020 accomplishments. Uh, uh, it's on the screen here. We promote the National Accessibility Awareness Week through social media and provided a presentation to Standing Committee on Accessibility and work at the committee. We do this every year. We keep you up to date, hopefully. 
we support the uh, reopening of the town's therapeutic pool to help uh, people with disabilities. Also last year, uh, we had the opportunity, if you remember, we put in a change room at the uh, Centennial Aquatic Center. And uh, we were able to monitor that, not as much as we'd like to, but the, the message that we got back was just amazing. So people could use it who needed help in changing. And also there was an accessibility lift. We uh, champion community and stakeholder engagement and consultation and development of strategic uh, multi-year action plan. Let me tell you, we started this plan in June 2019. Were we smart? Absolutely. We collected and interviewed uh, people through the farmer's market in September of 2019. We went to the newspapers and the town website, Engage, and we had a good handle well before the lockdown in March. Thank goodness. So, and in the 2020-2025 uh, multi-year accessibility plan was approved on September 21. We were happy for that. We uh, supported the in, uh, investigation of accessibility shuttle solution. That's still ongoing. I think we'll be always looking at how uh, people are uh, helped around the town. Various barrier identification complaints received and resolved. Uh, Sarah almost uh, does a, a terrific job with this. And we have meetings at every meeting. And we hear uh, many of the people who have concerns. And, and we listen. And I have to mention that uh, everything was resolved that we had a complaint about. Thanks again to Sarah. Uh, but the we barriers barrier identification oh, I, approval of the multi-year accessible plan dashboard to track priorities. We're always doing that. And uh, report of uh, the month initiative to share information applicable to the committee's mandate among members. We also um, we also looked at uh, sign language. As you, as you are aware, during COVID-19, uh, as we watch on the news, we see sign language all the time. And we were looking at the possibility for, uh, for to do this in Collingwood. We're still working on it. And then there was another initiative in 220. We met, I met, well, I met with George Christie and they wanted to look at the trail and maybe you're aware of it, the Pretty River Academy site to enhance the trail for the lookout. Apparently you can get out and look out. Well, we were managed and uh, we were told it was completed and we uh, passed it. We looked at the accessibility needs and approval. Anyway, uh, now we'll look at the 2021 uh, goals and priorities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Annual review of the projects and renovations to ensure compliance with the AODA. Well, that's, that's our job. That's what we do. Commence implementation of the 2020, 2025 multi-year accessibility plan, including tracking through the detailed dashboard system. I hope we can accomplish a few things. I've got, I want to get rid of this COVID-19 and so we can go on and, and do the things that we plan to do. Champion advocacy and awareness uh, of inclusion, accessible design and program opportunities for either virtual or in person. We want to be able to get back to accessibility awareness week where we can meet with the people, find out what they want find out what they need. We also want to get back to the farmer's market, talk to the people, hear them, and then go ahead and do things. Uh, enhance accessibility of the municipal website, including communications. You know, after, uh, for instance, we're looking at uh, talking about the website, we're looking at cognitive accessibility barriers. 
for instance, information that is difficult or impossible to access, read or understand, either due to technology or the way it's presented. So I'm saying, stay tuned. We're, we're trying to look at how we can better serve the people in Collingwood. And don't get me wrong, we've served them well in Collingwood. I remember when there was no curb openings. But I, and I remember when we looked at some of the buildings in uh, Collingwood, they were built in the 1800s. There was no wheelchairs, there was no scooters. So we had to make uh, changes to accommodate these people. And, and we put a, uh, on Pine Street, a, uh, a place for the buses and so forth. Anyway, uh, and last but not least, we attend the Community Social Services Roundtable to briefly update them on the purpose of the committee and to ensure liaison with the many groups who support accessibility. We're here to help. We're here to change. We're here to hear. We want to make Collingwood a very accessible place. Thank you again for this opportunity to share. Thanks, and let's get back to normal soon. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you for you, uh, for all you do at your committee and with your committee. Uh, you have made uh, immense strides in the last couple of years. So thank you and keep it up. Thank you. All right, Your Worship, our next up is Chair Jennifer McEwen from our Heritage Committee. If she would like to present the next two slides. Unmute. Okay. I'm unmuted. Yes, welcome, Jennifer. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if you can see me or not, but I will start. I can see uh, the mayor in the bottom corner there. Uh, thank you so much. And through the mayor, um, uh, I'd like to just talk briefly. I know you've had a long meeting today. Uh, but we have had some accomplishments in spite of all the challenges with COVID this year. Uh, and I'll start off with the designation of a new heritage property and uh, a, certainly a challenging one. I think it's been through several hands and uh, been on the plate of the um, Heritage Committee for quite some time, long before I was there. Uh, but now it is, it's been designated as a heritage property. Uh, and we also have one that's uh, in, um, in the process right now. It's just in, in progress on 243 Birch Street. So hopefully that will complete soon as well. We have awarded 18 properties and $40,000 in heritage grants this past year. Uh, support for uh, some, some very significant projects like Black Bellows and 33 St. Marie Street. Um, we had a, a terrific presentation done uh, just a couple of months ago with uh, architect Michael McClelland uh, talking about um, the evolution of heritage districts, uh, juxtaposition, and the different things that affect uh, heritage committees uh, and uh, the challenges that go along with it. Uh, very interesting. Hopefully there'll be more of those. Um, approval of various applications on site-specific basis. And again, through COVID, a number of challenges is wanting to be sympathetic with the situation, getting materials and such, uh, and try to balance that with upholding the heritage bylaw. Uh, but we've made it through and, uh, you know, it, it's uh, uphill from here. Uh, had a gentleman in um, uh, or that's been working for quite some time on a Wikipedia page and a, a quite extensive work, I gather, uh, for the uh, Heritage um, District. Uh, as well, I believe um, that they're working on updating the Heritage website um, and platform. And hopefully uh, that will come up online. It's been approved, but I gather that there's, um, it takes time to go through the Wikipedia approval. Uh, the page itself has been approved uh, and it's quite extensive. He's gone to a lot of work uh, 
gentleman's name is Stefan Somborak. And uh, he's, he's done a terrific job. Uh, as well, uh, we have uh, had a successful and productive working relationship with uh, the community and community organizations and hope that hopefully that will continue into the future. Uh, an example of that would be the ACO. They have been a wealth of knowledge and support. Um, in fact, I believe that there was a motion made last spring through the committee, one of our meetings, to include the, AC, the ACO at our table, not as a voting member, uh, I guess uh, similar to what uh, Lindsay from the museum, uh, her, her role at our meetings uh, used to be. Uh, we haven't seen her for a few months, hope to see her soon. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd like to follow up on where that is going with council. Uh, I know that we've been I understand we've been um, uh, brought down to a number of five on our committee, uh, but feedback is always good and certainly the experience of the ACO would be welcome, um, even as a non-voting member. Uh, and, and another one, uh, as far as uh, working relationships, Kathy DeRuder, who I understand has put many years uh, working with the, the town uh, into heritage uh, development over many years with Ron Martin. Uh, and she is also volunteering to do quite a bit of work in updating our uh, uh, information and database. So uh, we're looking forward to that and thank her for all her work. Uh, and then um, our participation in the downtown modernization project. So that was uh, 2020. We're looking forward to a great year in 2021. Uh, upcoming is our Heritage Week in February and annual awards. And uh, hopefully we have all the plaques and awards that we need in time uh, for Black Bellows and St. Marie. Black Bellows, by the way, was apparently nominated for an award for Ontario. Uh, I gather they didn't win, but the uh, acknowledgement is uh, is certainly noteworthy. And um, yeah, so that's coming up. Virtual doors, which is usually in the fall. Ideally, we don't have COVID to deal with and we can and go forward with that in, in the way that it's normally done in person, but certainly virtual uh, will be the uh, secondary um, uh, way that we go. Uh, we're hoping for more additional training sessions and discussion with uh, the heritage experts as we did with Michael McClelland and I guess, depending on COVID, uh, whether or not there'll be any uh, sessions that we can attend for upgrading our knowledge base. Um, and uh, coming up this year, we want to advocate for uh, would like to for 20% heritage tax relief. I know that's come up a few times and I guess there's been financial challenges for the town, uh, but we would like to uh, continue to advocate that and hope that maybe 2021 we'll, we will be awarded that. There are other areas in Ontario that are uh, offering up to 40%. So we're on the low end of the scale. And I think that the architecture and, and, and some of the beautiful places that we have for such a small town uh, certainly lends itself to drawing tourists in. So um, it's nice to know that people who own these properties have enough money because it is more expensive for them to do some of the work uh, that they have a little bit of help. So that will be coming up. Um, uh, we want to obtain a uh, commitment from the council to also in to increase the reserve fund, which I believe is at 37, 30, 30,000 right now, uh, in order that we can expand the uh, heritage district. A lot of properties in town that aren't even under designation yet. And there, there's still a lot of really nice places that probably should be. So we can always use help there as well. Uh, we also want to develop a resource list 
uh, because on the council or on our committee, we're, uh, it would, I guess it's a conflict of interest for us to suggest places that people can go to for custom windows and um, other uh, elements of uh, heritage architecture. Uh, so we, it has been suggested that we put together a resource list that people can go to where there's a list of people they can choose from. Uh, so we, we want to implement that this year, self-registry program for the suppliers and the contractors that they can put their names in. And then these people, uh, property owners of heritage properties have uh, a, a good start to go to. I think ACO has been helpful at times to people that know that they exist, uh, but this may, it may save them some work and like work and it'll be a resource that people can go directly to. Uh, and the heritage website platform, we want to migrate, I believe into the um, Wikipedia page. Uh, the brochures for the walking tours, I think there's four, I believe there's four, and we wanna just enhance them and bring them up to date. So we have a lot coming up in 2021. We look forward to it. And uh, we appreciate all the help that we get from the staff, uh, uh, from the town, all the town members, and um, uh, appreciate the council and all the work you do. Thank you. Any questions? Council, any questions? Thank you very much for that thorough presentation. And again, for all the work you do with your committee, it uh, certainly enhances our downtown, which is really one of the pride and joys of this community. So thank you very much to you and your committee. Thank you very much. Have Sarah, a good day. You too. Sarah, who's next? Thank you. So the next one is the Museum Advisory Committee. Um, so unfortunately, uh, the chair was unable to attend and uh, the vice chair, Rod Brown, has had some connection issues. So I'll quickly go over through uh, some of their accomplishments and goals. So uh, the committee um, attended uh, Collingwood and District Historical Society event with a booth to promote awareness of the Collingwood Museum. They established a muse uh, membership subcommittee to spearhead membership attraction and engagement. If, uh, supporting procedures and processes for the museum reopening following the provincial health recommendations as a result of COVID, uh, as well as the reopening walkthrough prior to public access, uh, investigation into FM broadcasting to support virtual initiatives, and professional development that they have done in participation with the Ontario Museum Association webinars. And next, uh, goals and priorities. Uh, they have, uh, they're looking forward to championing the development and imp implementation of a strategic plan, including uh, their uh, moving forward with their membership subcommittee, as well as a strategic approach to volunteerism, regular review of the strategic plan and realign priorities at the, as the pandemic evolves, assist in committee recruitment. Um, so I'll put a plug in here. They are going to be looking for a number of members uh, this year as a result of sun sunset clauses. Uh, so uh, we encourage people interested in the museum and heritage to uh, uh, support or look into uh, those opportunities. Uh, continue to guide and support staff in exploring and expanding their virtual offerings and finalizing a museum podcast showcasing stories from Collingwood's history. So next up, we have the Trails and Active Transportation. So we have Vice Chair Justin Jones is going to be speaking to these slides. So he's going to quickly review these because he's providing a detailed one on behalf of the committee to our Corporate Community Services meeting uh, later today. Okay. Yes. Um, so thank you so much for, uh, for having me. I uh, will try and be quick here. Um, first off, I just, I just really want to emphasize the fact that, um, you know, I work with municipalities all across the province and a lot of municipalities uh, that I touch base with in my professional life uh, haven't had committees meeting throughout the pandemic. And I just really wanna commend the town of Collingwood for uh, being agile, being adaptable and keeping this important committee work going. I think it is truly commendable the work that, uh, that Clerk Almas and her entire team have done to keep these vital committees working. And I just wanna say a big thank you to all our municipal staff for, uh, for getting us through this really weird time and setting a, a marvelous example for other municipalities, big and small all across Ontario. Um, 
the Trails and Active Transportation Committee is a brand new committee as of 2020. So uh, we're pretty proud of the accomplishments that we created. Um, you know, obviously we were the Trails Advisory Committee heading into 2020 and, uh, you know, we shifted our focus to establish the Trails and Active Transportation Advisory Committee. And we're really pleased with how that's been going. Um, we have been having our meetings in public, as I mentioned, and we've had delegations at the, at the committees and uh, we try and be open and transparent. Um, we've had some really great success, uh, you know, doing our, doing our part to uh, reduce, reuse and recycle, uh, recovering and repurposing lumber from some of the damaged uh, sections of our trails so that we can uh, take that, that lumber and repurpose it for other facilities. Uh, particularly the Cranberry Boardwalk. Um, we published a new trails map in 2020. Uh, we've been doing this annually and uh, it's been a great success. We always sell out our advertising partner sections, which I think is just a wonderful, uh, a wonderful show of success for our trails and active transportation. Uh, we started the conversation around the Maple Street Quiet Street project, which uh, is supported in the 2021 budget. It's a key priority of the committee and we'll talk about that in our, uh, in our 2021 goals. Um, we purchased 100 sets of bicycle lights uh, through Jennifer Parker, the uh, manager of community inclusion. Um, she's been doing some amazing work to build partnerships and enhance safety. Uh, and so kudos to her for making sure that those bike lights get to where they need to be. She had some successful events in front of City Hall handing out bike lights to those who needed it as, they, uh, as the, the days started to get a little shorter. Uh, we completed the rather robust um, bicycle friendly community designation reapplication that was required of us in uh, 2020. We're hoping to see what our uh, hopefully we'll move up to silver from our current bronze designation. Uh, we've been working really hard to advance the Collingwood to Village Trail uh, route, which has been uh, focused on resolving a critical creek crossing with the NBCA. And uh, of course, we've really been, uh, been helping to guide key town projects as we move forward into an incredibly ambitious 2021. So with that, I'll move on to our uh, 2021 goals, please. Whew, hope you all are ready. So uh, 2021 looks to be a great year for active transportation in Collingwood. The, uh, the Maple Street Quiet Project is on in the budget and we hope to, uh, to see that move forward. Uh, quickly into the engagement and consultation and implementation phase. Um, advocating for adding signage and pavement markings to our current and existing bike routes to bring them up to the standard through the Ontario Traffic Manual Book 18, which is uh, Ontario's cycling design guidance. Um, looking at some key additional pedestrian crossings at key cycling plan locations, um, primarily the, the crossing of Huron Street at Niagara, and potentially the uh, a crossing on Ontario Street where the train trail crosses. Uh, continuing to work on the George Christie Nature Trails, hopefully uh, wrapping up the final two sections to provide year-round access. Re, uh, really doubling the resurfacing and widening of our existing trails. Um, because we do have a lot of trails that are stone dust, they tend to get grown in, they become a little more narrow, the surface gets a little more rough, and then looking at making sure that we maintain the trails that we have is really important. We're there to assist with the development of the traffic calming policy and the deployment of traffic calming initiatives as necessary. We're happy and we've always been proud to be a working committee. Uh, we get out there and are, are happy to, to build stuff as, as required and, uh, and as asked. So if uh, the town needs support with the traffic calming policy, we are there. Um, we will be guiding the creation of a digital trails map to support the, uh, the physical map that we produce every year. Uh, we're looking at installing something different uh, where the trail junction gazebo is. That gazebo is uh, well past its, uh, its useful life. And so we are looking to collaboratively work with staff uh, to create a true uh, gateway in terms of trails to the city of Collingwood, something that we can be really proud of um, that can showcase both our, uh, our natural and our historic heritage. Uh, we're looking to improve our communication to the local community for the Trails and Active Transportation Advisory Committee. We know that a lot of people are really interested in the stuff that we're doing and the kind of things that we have to say. So we would like to strengthen those connections with, uh, with local organizations. Um, we're looking at branding and signing a key east-west cycling plan corridor. So that's the, uh, we're, we're tentatively calling it the, uh, the beach to blue route, um, which will take you all the way from Wasaga Beach 
all the way out to uh, to Blue Mountain Village through the use of some of our cycling facilities and uh, and trails. Um, we are working to further advance the Collingwood to Village route by securing access to some private lands, discussing with the final landowner there to hopefully get all our approvals in place so that we can move forward with that really important economic development project. Uh, and then hopefully looking at some of the next steps for some of our, um, for some of our, the, the pieces of our trails that have been eroded due to our high water. So particularly the hen and chickens trail. Um, we will continue to advise and provide guidance to the town on key capital projects. And uh, we're looking forward to the final installation of the two downtown bicycle parking shelters. So a lot on our plate. And uh, I just want to extend one final thank you to, uh, to city staff and particularly the, uh, the support staff for the, for the committee. Um, you know, Wendy Martin, uh, John Bellick, and uh, Stephanie, um, who I can never pronounce your last name properly, Hochran, I believe. And, uh, and of course, um, you know, we've been, uh, we've been calling on Director Slama quite a bit more often lately, and, uh, and she's been wonderful, as has Executive Director Culver. So thank you so much to the town for uh, continuing to support us as we move forward to become a more active community. Thank you, Justin. Are there any questions, uh, Council? Councilor McLeod, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just uh, two, actually. Um, uh, regarding Maple Street, uh, the Quiet Street project is at this point still a pilot project. Yes, uh, I just I have some friends on Maple Street, and I I don't want to uh, I don't want them to lose their minds thinking that that the project is a go forever and we're shutting down the street. Yeah, as far as I know, the uh, the plan in the budget was a pilot street project. Thank you for that clarification. I also was curious to know, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to Justin, um, are you working with any of the uh, trail apps that have become enormously popular in the last little while? I was just on uh, All Trails, and uh, the only trail within the town of Collingwood referenced at all is the Georgian Trail. And I just, uh, not that I want to, you know, invite more people to uh, to come here with their COVID breath. But you know, when things reopen, it might be good uh, to uh, to have some of our in-town trails highlighted on an app like that. Has that, um, has that been contemplated by your committee? Uh, that hasn't, that's a really great point. I think that once we have the, once we have the digital trail map and we have all the GIS files, um, that'll make that, that whole piece a lot easier. A lot of those trails apps are also user generated. So it's typically folks going on and inputting the trail uh, once they've gone and used it. So we, as a, as a committee, um, we've, we've done some advertising. We, we could have included in our 20, I can't remember if it was 2020 or 2021, because it's all a bit of a blur in it. Um, but uh, I think it was 2020 where we, we did, um, put in an advertisement for our trails in a uh, local um, hiking magazine or book called Loops and Lattes. And it focuses on the uh, some hiking and uh, cycling trail loops around the region and coffee shops. So that was a good one for that was more targeted to local audience, but certainly um, looking to get ourselves onto some of those like all trails would be great. Thank, Thank you for you. that suggestion. <laughs> Thanks. Council, any other questions or comments? Councilor Comey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Justin, thank you so much for your presentation. I know there was a lot to cover there. Uh, could you kindly restate, and I apologize, I just, I had to grab a different pen. Um, the pedestrian crossings that you're focused on, I wasn't able to jot down which ones in particular. So, I uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I believe that uh, the crossing at um, Niagara Street across Huron to get to Sunset Point, um, that's a, that's a, the bigger kind of the, the same kind of style uh -huh. as on here, Ontario, like a big pedestrian crossover with like um, an actuated signal. Uh, that is, I believe in the 2021 budget and then uh, we were, we've been identifying different locations, including the crossing at Ontario Street of the train trail. That was another one that uh, we did a, we did a, a series of 12 hour counts at that facility to, uh, to analyze uh, and provided that to the town engineering staff to analyze whether or not a crossing was warranted there. 
Oh, very cool. Through you, Ms. Ray. That's great to know that for that you provided uh, the counts. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, so that, that was my question. Thanks again. Uh, thank you for supporting the bike light uh, program. We saw that was so well received, especially obviously by our students. And it was so great to see that we got that the town did it twice. So thank you so much uh, to the trails committee for their contribution to that. Any other questions or comments, council? Seeing none, Justin, thank you very much for that. Please thank Chair Knowles and the rest of your committee for all the great work you've done. Thank you very much. And Sarah, where are we now? Are we uh, up to the BIA? We have Mr. Conning here. Welcome, Dave. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, Mayor Saunderson, Deputy Mayor Hall, uh, Council and staff. Um, 2020, for the downtown was obviously uh, a, a very difficult year. Uh, normally January, February for independent businesses is a bit of a slow time. Uh, and then we generally will uh, we'll stock up and get ready for shifting gears when March break comes around and we see a bit of a boost back. Uh, little did anyone know that shifting gears meant shifting to neutral. Uh, unfortunately, um, but we did have some, uh, some, some good accomplishments in 2020. Uh, first on the list here is the, uh, uh, the street vacuum that we, that we purchased, uh, a, an amazing machine, uh, which we have dubbed the Ed, uh, and uh, in honor of, uh, of the late Ed Christie, one of the one of the fathers of the Collingwood BIA, um, we have also started. Uh, we're getting ready to start the implementation of the first phase of the Garden Master Plan. The Garden Master Plan uh, was something where we uh, uh, went out with an RFP, and and it it came back, and uh, a, a consultant has been selected. We've seen the first draft of the plan. And we have sent it back for some revisions so that we can get a, uh, an update. Uh, a lot of input went into it. A uh, hundred page document, very concise. And, and we've got some ideas for changes. So once that comes back, uh, it, will be, uh, it will be published. Um, COVID-19 health guidelines made us change the, the form of the, uh, of the farmer's market. But none, nonetheless, it, it was uh, a successful market this year. And, uh, and going forward uh, this year, uh, uh, discussions will have already, we've already had discussions regarding implementing, implementing some of the same uh, guidelines this year uh, and, and looking at some other options for the farmer's market. It's such a, it's such a, a, a great thing to do uh, uh, on the weekends. Um, we are also involved with the Main Street Modernization Project that is ongoing. It does tie into uh, the promotion of the downtown and also the, uh, uh, the wayfinding around downtown. Very exciting project. And, and we're at that table with our thoughts on it as well. Um, we restructured the BIA board this year, uh, which was, uh, it was a difficult thing to do, um, but an important thing to do. In, in the past, as you know, there were eight uh, portfolios of responsibility for the, for the board members. Um, we restructured into four um, uh, advisory committees, two of which are the main focus, which are the core responsibilities of a, of a BIA, um, those being beautification of the downtown and promotion of the downtown. And uh, this has really, in my opinion, uh, changed things uh, for the BIA. And it seems to be working very well with the new members. Each of the four uh, advisory committees um, has a minimum of two directors, three to five voting BIA members, and also members of the public uh, are, are invited to apply to join those as well. So the additional populating of those priorities uh, really helped to, has really helped to get more input and more feedback from, from the members. Um, 
the BIA strategic plan um, uh, has also been restructured because of the, uh, the restructuring of the board format and also the changing priorities resulting from COVID. Uh, we will continue to support the art crawl. Uh, we, uh, and, and, and we were able to support other arts and culture focused events in the downtown. Very difficult to do this year when you, you want the event to happen, but you don't want uh, people to congregate. It's, uh, it's a bit of a, a challenge. Um, but our goal this year really was to make sure that we do not look like a shuttered ghost town. We continue to look vibrant and ready for action as soon as we can open again. Um, and the, the feedback was strong in that uh, when we did reopen after the spring shutdown, uh, the community did come back downtown to show their support. And, uh, and, and sales for many downtown stores uh, was, was quite good after we reopened despite the fact that you had to limit the number of people inside and go and, and abide by the, the guidelines of, uh, of the health uh, community. Um, we did extensive holiday decor downtown as everyone saw. Uh, what we decided to do was because we had so many things planned and ready to fund during the year that needed to be uh, canceled uh, or worked in a different way that did not require that amount of cost, we diverted those funds to really highlight the downtown for Christmas and invest in items that uh, now have been put away and will be used uh, in Christmases to follow. Um, Santa did come to town uh, and we, had the Christmas market, which was to run uh, three Friday evenings. It's always been a struggle to have independent businesses stay open longer hours into the evenings, but this was a, this was a great event. It was well promoted by our promotion uh, folks. And uh, the, the first Friday was a little slow. The second Friday was crazy. And we found that we had actually created a bit of a problem uh, it was a little too uh, busy uh, and in the interest of public health and safety, we unfortunately needed to uh, forego the, the third Friday. It has though given us the uh, uh, sort of the footprint and guidelines in order to, uh, in order to fire it up again, possibly for spring activities in the evenings summer activities fall and and those are things that that we will discuss with the board if i could go to the next slide please uh in 2021 um we are very much focusing on engagement of bia members um we we very much want to on an ongoing basis get feedback to make sure that we're doing the right things and whether initiatives were a benefit and how much of a benefit they were to the individual businesses and services. Uh, we are redesigning our website that is going on right now. Uh, it will be much more, uh, give us much more ability to up, upgrade the website, update the website uh, internally. Uh, again, we, there is the continuation of the garden master plan and the main street modernization. Um, we would like to get to a point as quickly as possible where we can see physical um, uh, changes that, uh, uh, that, that uh, improve the downtown. Um, the implementation of the advisory committees and reports to, uh, to the board, um, I spoke to that a little earlier. That continues and seems to be working very well. I'm really pleased with the people, uh, all, the, all the people who have uh, given their time to the board. Uh, we have a very strong uh, uh, group of folks, very active uh, in what they're doing. Um, 
we update existing policies and uh, we it's important that we try to finalize the MOU, the memorandum, memorandum of understanding between the town and the BIA so that we have a clear definition of who is responsible for what. Um, it comes up in issues such as the garden master plan. There are things that the BIA needs to do in terms of power in the gardens, but the gardens aren't ours. We don't. And so there is an over, uh, there is, I wouldn't say an overlap. It, we dovetail on some of these things. We need to understand exactly who's responsible for what. Um, we will look at a boundary realignment uh, in, in light of the uh, official plan uh, and, and, uh, and, and consider uh, uh, what our boundary should be. Does it make sense according to the, the, uh, the official plan and, and where it's going in the future? Um, we uh, have implemented a, a target marketing program to new residents. Uh, we have, I shouldn't say that, we will implement a target marketing program to new residents, sort of a welcome package um, that will go out to new residents uh, uh, to introduce them to the downtown, what's available, and, and, uh, and make sure that, uh, that everyone knows that, uh, you know, if you haven't come downtown, then you really haven't, you haven't seen the town. Um, the last item is regarding the new uh, waste and waste and recycling system that will be implemented uh, by the county at the end of this year. <clears throat> we have begun to uh, try to dialogue with the county to express uh, our our need to be involved. Um, it's a very good system with large bins. We have concerns over how it can be implemented in the downtown uh, to fall in lines with the, to, to still fall in line with the, the beautiful downtown that we have. Also the heritage uh, concerns of it. We have talked to other communities uh, who have seen it happen. And, and we have some important feedback to discuss with the, with the county on it. One way or another, we need to make sure that we maintain the beauty of our downtown. Um, that is, uh, that's really the, the, the gist of it. We, there are other things being worked on uh, regarding arts, arts and culture, for example, and, and uh, uh, a possible uh, fashion event and, and things like that. At this point, in terms of real activities, uh, we're looking at uh, the fall, I would think. I think that's reasonable. Hopefully, you know, if we are ready though, if things open sooner and, and if, uh, if, if, if uh, uh, COVID gets under control sooner than expected, uh, that would be wonderful, and we're ready to to jump on that with with other plans. But at this point, uh, that's sort of the timing that we that we are looking at. Uh, thank you very much. If anyone has any questions about the downtown, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Dave. Uh, any questions or comments, Council? Seeing none, you have done an excellent job. And uh, thank you, Dave, for it's been a very uh, busy year for you guys with the changes and uh, keep up the great work and please uh, pass along our regards. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, Council, just for your information, uh, I'm anticipating a bio break once we get through this report, unless there's any urgent requirement right now. Seeing none, then Sarah, let's finish up with this, uh, with the uh, committee's report, and then we'll take a brief break uh, after and before the judicial inquiry report. Certainly, Your Worship. Our next is Nina Robitaille as the chair of uh, our Collingwood Public Library Board. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to all the attendees today, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to share some of the great work that the uh, Collingwood Public Library Board has accomplished in 2020, which, um, as we've heard time and time again, was a, a rather um, interesting and uh, surprising year for us all. 
So uh, as required, we uh, of course conduct open public meetings, which folks are invited to attend. And uh, we are still of course allowing that opportunity uh, as we conduct our meetings via Zoom. We ensured that the library and the staff uh, were positioned to respond to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and related provincial emergency orders, as well as our local public health orders uh, by supporting the closure when it was um, indicated as the best step, as well as delegating operational authority to the CEO. So uh, decisions could be made and implemented um, in an efficient manner. We marked the library's 10th anniversary. Uh, there were lots of plans and the staff did a terrific job uh, getting the information out there and selecting some fantastic activities for the community to enjoy. Um, and we're equally uh, affected that shift those activities to an online platform. So over the course of a week, community members uh, were invited to participate in uh, several different events to mark that fantastic uh, milestone for our library. We supported the elimination of barriers that uh, are often presented through fines um, for overdue materials uh, during the pandemic. And we also extended the fine free practice indefinitely, um, which has had a fantastic response thus far. We focused on uh, various virtual methods that were available to meet community needs by expanding our virtual service and enhancing our member and community engagement through the public library website. Um, the staff were very creative and innovative in some ideas um, and action items that helped bring the library a little closer to folks, um, even though they were only able to see it through their screen. Um, the staff also conducted a diversity audit, um, which highlighted some priorities for collection development. Um, and that's a, a really timely um, procedure that will help us as we move forward in our 2021 goals. Uh, lastly, we'd like to highlight um, that we supported the staff, uh, the CEO, um, and the community's uh, access to the library through a staged pandemic reopening plan, which um, our CEO and staff team put uh, hours and hours of work into ensuring that met the guidelines and adhered to all the controls to keep our community members, um, as well as our staff team, of course, safe. Uh, for the next slide, our goals for 2021, uh, first and foremost, uh, is to move forward with our strategic plan refresh um, to identify the opportunities and the best path forward to ensure we're able to meet the diverse needs of our community. Um, we're also going to engage in a, a review, an organizational development review of sorts, where we take a look at what our community needs and how best to organize our staff uh, job descriptions to ensure we can meet those um, expectations. Uh, it's our responsibility as the board to respond to societal and behavioral changes that are brought on by the needs of the community. And um, we look at 2021 as an opportunity to, to build on the great work that the um, library staff has done in 2020 to meet the needs of the community, to be nimble and flexible in how we approach library services in Collingwood, um, and really have an eye on the uh, impact that Collingwood citizens have felt through this uh, changing world, make sure that we're able to provide materials and services that um, really give everybody their best opportunity to to grow and learn and be part of the community through the library. I'd like to take a minute just to thank everybody um, who contributes to all the wonderful things that the library um, is able to accomplish. Our board members, um, Councillor Berman as our representative from council, um, my vice chair, the, uh, the highly competent and enthusiastic CEO and staff team at the Collingwood Public Library, the town staff who assist us um, in accomplishing our, our goals and meeting our procedural guidelines, as well as the community for embracing the virtual reality that we faced in 2020 um, and really helping us understand uh, their needs. Thank you for that, Nina. Uh, Councillor, are there any uh, questions or uh, comments for Chair Robitaille? Seeing none, thank you very much again for the thorough report and all the hard work you've done over there with your Vice Chair and the committee.
and uh, look forward to hearing about about how 2021 goes. And I think that brings us to the uh, Police Services Board. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I am honored to chair the uh, Collingwood Police Services Board and I am assisted with four other board members, uh, Vice Chair Reverend Donna Wilson, and of course the other uh, council representative, Mayor Saunderson. And uh, we have two provincial appoint appointments, Drew Rowe and Wilhelmine Schur. So it's a very uh, dynamic and um, ambitious group uh, with very uh, successful results, uh, both for this year and looking forward to next year. And of course, we're supported by our CAO, Sonia Skinner and uh, Stephanie Hochran, who does such a great job with all of the committees as secretary. And then we liaise very closely with the detachment commander and or interim detachment commander, as it may be, and the staff sergeant or acting staff uh, sergeant, de depending on uh, secondments. And I would just start out first by saying, um, how fortunate Collingwood is to have um, uh, such an innovative and committed uh, OPP detachment to looking after the safety of our community. And uh, so the board appreciates very much uh, the work that they do. And COVID-19 we've heard has reached out to a lot of our committees and our our, our police members are no different and their ability to be flexible and pivot with the requirements of uh, enforcement within the um, emergency orders and um, their uh, direction from on high from the province of Ontario is, um, is uh, well, it's recognized and much appreciated. So in 2020, uh, you can see that um, the board endorsed the updated town of Collingwood bylaws and OPP service schedule. Uh, we collaborate so well between bylaws and the detachment uh, in terms of uh, the enforcement of uh, the bylaws and um, what needs to happen in the town of Collingwood. And uh, there was a, a recommendation for the board and staff to review a security alarm registration program. The number of false alarms that come in is quite disturbing and uses up a lot of the time for um, police services that be, could be put to more urgent matters. Um, we had a signi significant amount of input into the Ministry of Solicitor General's roundtable discussions regarding uh, the Community Safety and Policing Act 2019. It was a new bro act brought in and changed the governance of the Police Services Board. And I attended an event in a really uh, pre-COVID where you could actually go in person. And I know our vice chair participated on one in line. And you'll see further down the list, we've all... Um, participated in the board training with the Solicitor General's office and we did it jointly with the Town of Blue Mountains Police Services Board. Um, we were able to approve a $5,000 donation to the Project Lifesaver uh, Simcoe, which is assisting our detachment in um, protecting and keeping safe some of our vulnerable people in Collingwood. And um, there was a reallocation of $15,000 from the DARE account to the Police Services Board account. And this was as a result of, um, if you will, a summary of uh, the funding. And some of it comes from the courts in terms of some of the fines that are directed to um, our Police Services Board account for work in the community. Um, and we were very pleased, and I, I thought this was a, an excellent initiative to champion a scholarship of up to $750 for our police auxiliary members. They add so much um, to the quality and ability of our detachment and the many things they do in our community. And I thought it was an important um, step for us to put towards um, their training. And we did allocate up to $600 for bike bells, or, um, or it could be used for similar safety enhancements for youth and that the OPP and town staff could use these to teach and encourage safe uh, bicycling riding for students. Uh, the time targeted was during the 2020 back to school period, but it, I'm sure it's with the hope of developing lifetime uh, safe practices on their bicycles. Um, and then finally, we provided key guidance. This is the most major part of our job uh, and adopted the OPP Collingwood and Blue Mounts detachment, the action plan. And we were very appreciative of the people as in all things uh, Collingwood surveys, we did enjoy a great response on our request uh, from the public engagement as to what the community saw as the priorities uh, through our policing. So in 2021, while our list looks very short, I can assure you that contained within the, uh, the action plan 
plan that would go for pages that we monitor, but of course is to implement that plan that we've just developed. And um, we did uh, create a 2021 pilot to allocate up to $10,000 uh, for publicly um, a publicly community communicated PSB grant program for community organizations or services that will support Collingwood's policing services and or help us accomplishing our community uh, safety and well-being plan. And so um, thank you very much to all who contribute. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Chair Jeffrey. Uh, questions, Council? Councillor Comey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Councillor Jeffrey, I'd be remiss not to thank the Police Services Board for also contributing to the Bike Bell program. And a huge thank you for welcoming uh, presentations on back to school safety and uh, to the board and Staff Sergeant Mecker for really taking that back to school safety initiative and speed residential speeding concerns uh, so seriously. So thank you uh, to you and the board for really being very proactive in those matters. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Doherty. My apologies. Um, I also, I think I would be remiss. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, speak with the um, SAVE program um, officers yesterday. Those are the folks who are um, overseeing the use of snowmobiles uh, and um, SUVs, or sorry, um, not SUVs, those three wheelers on our trails. And uh, they are doing a terrific job. And um, some of the residents who passed by had good things to say about their presence on our trails and on our roads. So thank you very much to the board uh, and to um, the officers involved. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Any other questions or comments, Council? Seeing none, I think this brings us to our last committee, which is the Committee of Adjustments and Property Standards. Our worship, we have yes. Joanne Bowden okay. as chair. Good afternoon, Mayor Saunderson and committee members. Good afternoon, Joan, go ahead. Uh, the Committee of Adjustment is comprised of five members and meets monthly, and we've been able to continue uh, effectively through Zoom meetings with the public. The purpose of our uh, committee is to adjudicate minor variances, severances, severances and property standard appeals. Uh, in 2020, we were able to conduct open public meetings through Zoom that encourage community and stakeholder participation. And we have uh, had 12 minor variants in incidental applications and three minor variants applications, 10 consent applications. And I guess we had no property standards this year. Uh, we also participated in a new a three committee member uh, fence viewers uh, with attendance of uh, two viewings that were su successfully rendered and a decision was not appealed. And that's always a good thing on this job, not to get appealed. For 2021, we're going to continue to conduct fair and timely and thorough reviews and finalize a clear and consistent terms of reference. Thank you, Joanne. And um, I think the news there is that you don't have to worry about fence viewings anymore. Uh, yes. We'll away with that responsibility for you. But uh, thank you very much for handling those two. Council, are there any questions or comments for Chair Bowden? I think you've covered all the bases, Joanne. Thank you very much. And thank you to you and your committee for all your hard work. Thank you. All right, Sarah, I think that brings uh, the end of the... Uh, committee board presentations. Thank you very much to all the committee chairs that attended today. And uh, I don't know if you have any concluding words, Sarah. Uh, I think you were 
Thank you, Worship. I'll just be quick. Uh, I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, actually, all of our committee and board uh, chairs were advised that they had two minutes, but as you can see, they have way more accomplishments and way more goals than we could have imagined. So uh, I thank you uh, for their time. Um, we've implemented two this year, uh, a chair and vice chair orientation. It's proved uh, very successful, as you can hear from all of our chairs today and vice chair uh, Jones. Um, they've been very, they've provided great leadership to their uh, group. So thanks to all of them for participating today. Well, thank you, Clerk Thomas, uh, for that and for all you do coordinating these committees. They do a great amount of work in our community and they're vital to uh, the success of our operations. Um, so council, it's now uh, 10 to five. What I uh, suggest is that we take a 10 minute uh, uh, recess bio break and then we'll be back at 5 p.m. for the judicial inquiry report. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Sorry, I'll just add that um, our corporate and community services meeting is a separate link. And uh, once we conclude our meeting of SIC, we will jump on that link. But all those that are attending the uh, corporate and community services, um, it will be open. There will be, will be um, a display on their screen that uh, the meeting will still be happening immediately following the SIC. However, when council members do end up joining that meeting, you'll be brought into the meeting live. So just be cautious of your, um, your video and your sounds that are around. That's it. Good, thank you, Sarah. All right, council back here in 10 minutes.
Hey, Brian. Hi. Are we live? No. No, I don't think so. Not yet. I'm here. I don't know. I can't see anybody but you. Um, oh. We've got uh, one, two, three, four oh, of us. No, I can see. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. thinking that uh, we should start SIC meetings earlier going forward. Uh, well, we can we can talk about that. Um, Excuse me, Mayor Sonnen, we are, are live now. Yeah, just wait for confirmation from Sarah. Just suffice it. It'll just be a moment. It takes a little bit for this to stream live to the YouTube um, as well. So I think we're ready. All right, uh, thank you. So we call council to order. And before we move into the judicial inquiry report, uh, there's a motion and it is uh, as follows. That staff report C-2020, 2021, sorry, dash one annual report on board and advisory committee activities from 2020 and priorities for 2021 be herein received. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Moved by Councillor Comey, seconded by the deputy mayor. All in favor. And that is passed unanimously, thank you. So that brings us to uh, item 7.2, CAO 2021-2, phase one, Collingwood Judicial Inquiry, next steps. And I will pass it over, oh, uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Jeffrey. Sorry, Councillor, you're muted. I clicked that it didn't take, thank you. Um, I just wanted, before we got into the staff report, I just wanted to let you know my intention to ask for the um, clauses to be severed and that eventually after discussion, I have two amendments I would like to propose between receiving the report and proceeding with the request for proposal. Okay, thank you for that. I, I think what we'll do is uh, let staff take us through the report uh, and uh, have discussion, and then we get into the items. We will uh, we'll sever them out. So go ahead, uh, CEO Skinner. I just I turned my yuck off because my clock is going. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. What we'll do is, I believe uh, the clerk's office has a presentation that was circulated earlier that will provide a high level summary of the uh, uh, of the report. Uh, so I'll bring you through that uh, quickly. And uh, I think it'll come up shortly. I don't know if I'm just not seeing it. Oh, there it is. Okay, wonderful. Go. Thank you. Well, uh, on the count cover page here, I just want to say thank you, first of all, to all the people who've appeared and who've written letters. Uh, it's really satisfying to work on something that is uh, this important to our community. Uh, we've done a review of the, uh, of the justices report, uh, talked to a number of different folks and stakeholders, not in any sense all of the talking we need to do. Uh, but this proposal is coming forward for council's consideration. Uh, we've anticipated the amount of engagement you desire and we really look forward to your input so we can confirm and fully agree on the next steps. I think a sense of urgency does exist in, uh, in pushing this and it is balanced with um, our drive uh, to assure that we've done a comprehensive and professional uh, approach and the work uh, is uh, well done. Uh, you'll see that this is largely forward looking and uh, we've tried hard to figure out a way that will engage our stakeholders and partners in action we want to distinguish the Collingwood inquiry from others in the sense that this is not shelfware. We want to work just as hard as we've done to date on getting the facts on the table to get the recommendations implemented, not only here in Collingwood, um, but more broadly across Ontario and potentially even the influence uh, on the Canadian scale. And I wanted to say thank you to Clerk Almas, who's done extensive work on the recommendations in this report. Slide two. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this one. We talked about the timing earlier, but from a kickoff in February of 2018 um, through uh, mid-2019 toward the end of 2019, uh, there were 63 days of public hearings in three parts. 
And uh, the long anticipated the report that we thought we might receive early in the summer did eventually um, with some COVID and other considerations come to us in November with 306 recommendations. So those recommendations on the next slide um, came in a, a report that looked uh, at a front cover that looked like what's on your screen. And then the next slide, slide four, is the key subject areas. Um, these are the subject areas that uh, the report was uh, sliced into by the uh, uh, Justice Morocco. And um, you can see that procurement is the largest slice and it's about 28% uh, of the recommendations. And that's balanced by an almost equal number of recommendations that apply to council members and staff. And uh, lobbying came uh, behind that with a number of other, other topics. But of course, you can never judge a book totally by its cover. So the number of recommendations may not correspond with the difficulty of making sure some of these are implemented. Uh, but so far, the um, status that's shown on slide five uh, shows the initiative that uh, a couple of councils um, and staff have taken. And um, you have to remember, and I know council remembers, and I hope that uh, the listening public will also remember, that the judici judicial inquiry was looking at a point in time. So since uh, 2012, you'll see there's the largest blue slice on the left. There's about 43% of the recommendations have already been delivered and about 21% are substantially complete. And as well, the, uh, there's a number about municipal corporations that would no longer apply to Collingwood, but of course we'd uh, um, want to promote for other municipalities. So things that we've done is a very long list, but everything from code of conducts for council, um, council staff relations policy and a complete lobbyist registry program among many others that are set out in the report. As well, um, uh, despite fears of overwhelming the reader, uh, Appendix A that's available online for the report sets out a detailed status for each of the 306 recommendations. And uh, I did find and I think Clerk Almas's work underlined this, that um, um, many they're consistent. Many of them um, overlap somewhat, and there's a certain amount of analysis required to figure out where each should be implemented. Slide six um, starts to introduce a new concept, uh, which is other recommended actions. And at this point, these are other recommended actions by, uh, by staff. We've started this draft list but there's things that don't come out of a judicial inquiry um, or that weren't in the recommendations, but we still think uh, should be acted upon. Um, so there's a few things that have been assigned to Collingwood in that first bullet, uh, the code of conduct and election training for potential con uh, candidates. But we really think these are much broader than Collingwood. And for example, the code of conduct and some of the key things in a code of conduct uh, could be implemented as high in the hierarchy as directly in the Municipal Act. An election training for potential uh, candidates we welcome in Collingwood, but certainly every election candidate across Ontario uh, could benefit from the same type of training. Uh, there's a number of changes to things like the workplace harassment and violence policies. Um, in that realm, we're even looking at things like whistleblowing and how that would work in the protection for people who want to speak up and, and ask questions and have someone of whom to ask those questions. We do think that there are some changes potentially in the judicial inquiry processes that would help to advise municipalities like our own as we go forward. Um, things like uh, expected cost parameters, um, and if in fact, and there was a short discussion on this earlier tonight, if there are ways that a municipal council uh, during or leading up to a judicial inquiry could manage costs or better articulate scopes with an understanding of what those might cost. There were also some questions raised about um, whether a simple majority, in fact, is the right trigger for something as impactful as a public inquiry. And finally, the recording of in-camera meetings was found very recently by, uh, by our own council to be a practice you'd like to consider, uh, uh, not you'd like to consider, you have extended, and that there may be broader applicability beyond Collingwood for that. 
So this is a, a draft list and something that we would uh, continue to develop as we consulted with council, the public, and, uh, and others, uh, stakeholders. Slide seven, um, I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but basically I mentioned that in the 306 recommendations, there's a lot of things that uh, you know, could be put in one policy or another. So we've started notionally to say that procurement bylaws, unsolicited proposal guidelines, and real property acquisition guidelines could be consolidated in a single consolidated procurement bylaw that would cover all of those items and look at many of the consideration, well, all of the considerations for selling or buying products as a municipality. Likewise, we've looked at the, the code of conduct um, and how to place that a consolidated code of conduct uh, for staff that would include the uh, ethical conduct. Um, looking at a workplace harassment and violence policy uh, with a focus on discrimination and human rights and a couple of other items that are noted there uh, and available to you in the report. Slide eight, uh, it was our uh, community-based strategic plan. Everything we do in this follow-up should help us to uh, achieve the vision, the community-based vision um, that, that, that we set out, including transparent and accountable local government. And I think for me, I wanted to include this slide because it is a bit about timing expectations. Um, here, when we set this plan, we thought that in the short term, we would implement the lobbyist registry program. And in the medium term, between three and five years, we would uh, uh, do our implementation. Now, I think now that we've actually seen the report, we're going to far exceed, um, you know, some of the, get things done a lot sooner than we thought uh, we might when we set this up. But it is important to remember we're not at the end, but we're in the middle of a journey that's going to change uh, many policies. It's going to change culture, and I think it's going to uh, have broad influence. So there's a, a set of um, proposed motions that appear in the report. And if you go here now to this next slide nine, um, so we're going to talk about proceeding with a request for proposals and a little bit hidden at the end of that one, I'll point out that we also propose that you endorse the proactive engagement of key partners and stakeholders. So the fairness monitoring program is, uh, is in slide 10. And uh, what we, this is something we have not had in the past and uh, it, it's not unheard of, uh, there have been other ones, but basically it's looking to provide some type of independent insur assurance that significant procurements or sales are conducted in a fair, open and transparent way. So a fairness monitor would observe the process, uh, provide impartial opinions to counsel prior to an award decision. And then uh, the decision to retain a fairness monitor is proposed to be at the discretion of the chief administrative officer. Um, and it would be for any you know, sort of significant procurement. Uh, for example, um, a complex procurement that you'll be presiding over in the next year would be the uh, an RFP for a, a reuse of the grain terminal. So that would be somewhere where we could use uh, something like a fairness monitoring program. And we've proposed on slide 11, you'll see uh, that uh, we do this as an RFP. So we would uh, re, um, because our integrity commissioner contract is running out, uh, we would issue an RFP for joint services immediately for an integrity commissioner, a lobbyist register and the fairness monitor. And you may be a little confused by the lobbyist registrar because we do in fact um, have an accountability uh, officer position that has been doing the lobbyist registrar decisions. Um, and it was recommended in the uh, justice's report that that registrar function, only the decision, is this lobbying or is it not, um, actually go to a third party that reports directly to council. So all the policy would be retained with the accountability officer. It's just those, is this lobbying decisions. Um, a five-year non-renewable contract and the successful proponent would continue to provide training and be a resource uh, for council, the staff and the public. Slide 12 uh, gives you a few uh, logos of the folks that were uh, seeking your 
endorsement for uh, proactive engagement with uh, the County of Simcoe per your uh, resolution at a recent council meeting, the Ontario Public Buyers, AMCTO, AMO, the Ontario Municipal Administrators Association, of course, the province and um, at both the staff and the uh, elected officials uh, uh, levels. And we're hoping to also engage with FCM. On slide 13, there is uh, the next part of the proposed motion. And it is that uh, we are proposing that we write three white papers. Uh, each white paper would set out the motivation to act, um, what the recommended changes are, and to whom the changes would apply. And we've set this out in three pieces because we were looking to truly engage people and to set um, a manageable scope of discussion with an effective grouping of partners and stakeholders. So hopefully you'll, uh, you'll like this one, but uh, the next slide, which is slide 14, uh, groups what we thought might be the priority to proceed and uh, how it, they would go together. So the session one would be all about the council and staff items. So earlier tonight, you talked about the priority of updating the code of conduct for council. So that would be part of the first, uh, the first session, um, as well as any pol policies about ethics and behavior. And uh, uh, Clerk Almas has done most of the writing for these updated proposed policies already with um, Jocelyn McCauley, our former accountability officer. And uh, we're looking uh, for endorsement to uh, consult between mid-March and mid-April with that white paper coming forward to council uh, prior to being released. And then the second two sessions would be another one from mid-May to mid-June that talks a lot about procurement and lobbying and fairness. And a third one that's more about the process uh, later this spring and into early summer. So uh, judicial inquiry processes, advice to other municipalities, et cetera. Uh, slide uh, 15 talks about uh, what we do with the white papers after we've had input on them. And the intention is that we would report back to you with a comprehensive set of recommendations for action. And um, I think that when you get those, I hope that what you'll be seeing is some of the best in ethical governance and transparency that Ontario has to offer. Um, they will be uh, well consulted and uh, well informed and um, uh, for that schedule. It will also allow us to, uh, and if you could uh, go to slide 16, please. The three report backs as you see them here between May uh, at the earliest, possibly June and September would set us up well for a couple of things. Um, one is that we have a one year report back to uh, 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 that's uh, on our progress uh, that would come up in November. Um, if it was deemed appropriate upon each set of council decisions, and if we were accepted by publishers, uh, we could do articles on the findings and changes more broadly in places like Municipal World Magazine or appropriate uh, 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 forums such as that. And it would also set us up very well for 2022 to potentially do things like, if accepted, um, speaking at conferences, potentially even AMO or FCM. Slide 17 is uh, probably the question that everybody wants answered that we don't have an answer for you or the public tonight. Uh, so potential charges by the OPP. Uh, I have uh, spoken with um, the manager uh, that is, uh, is looking into uh, or making the recommendations on whether the OPP um, will make charges to any of the people who are engaged uh, in these reports. Um, they are still making their final decisions. Um, I think they're getting close to them, but they didn't have a time frame that the, um, uh, that they could commit to. Uh, but I did want to remind people, particularly those in the public, that uh, the OPP has a sole role to determine if those charges are warranted. I did offer staff support if there was anything that could be made available from the town that would uh, help them come to their decision. And uh, they indicated they didn't need anything at this time and were very aware of the judicial inquiries report and had, uh, had reviewed it. 
And the judicial inquiry also did something um, that was mentioned earlier this evening, which is a comp compelling the release of information that we could never have gotten as a municipality. So I have asked our uh, inquiry council if um, there are any uh, uh, final sum up um, advice or actions that they think should be pursued. Um, they have not yet reported back and um, tentatively uh, been scheduled into a, a closed session of council um, at the next council meeting, but it will depend on the, the, uh, the content of the uh, reports uh, that they wish to bring forward. So uh, I'm just not sure. I, I think it will happen in the next couple of weeks, but I'm just not sure in what format until they've proceeded further in their review. Uh, the review that I have asked them to do um, is a very high level. Uh, we wanted to make sure that council direction um, was received on those next steps, if any, uh, before getting uh, too far down any particular path of action. And finally, um, at the last slide, we're just uh, as staff looking forward to public and council feedback back on what's been proposed and uh, how we'll continue on this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, on the extensive report, and this is obviously an issue that is extremely important to our public and to this council. Uh, questions, Councillor Berman. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Um, just a couple quick clarifications from the staff report and then just a few comments. So I guess through you to, um, Son to, to the CAO, because I think she addressed them, but uh, I've never written a staff report. So under input from other sources, you've listed uh, the two legal firms and the uh, uh, integrity commissioner. Did you, uh, was there any input on this from either of the, uh, I guess CAOs that were <laughs> to do with this before you. Tanya? Thank you, uh, through your worship. I have uh, uh, spoken with uh, both of the CAOs and uh, one of them provided me with some informal input and, uh, uh, but um, not extensive input to date. Uh, however, I had uh, considered uh, both in trying to put the right information together. Okay, thank you. And the second one, just to clarify, because you, uh, there's a difference, uh, and I think you knew what you were talking about between our the local OPP and the uh, anti rackets branch. So when you say that you've you've given a report or you're you're talking timeline, are you talking about if you're actually speaking to the anti rackets branch, or are you talking to our local OPP detachment? Uh, through the chair, uh, your worship, to Council Berman, I would say that I am talking with the anti-rackets branch. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. And I appreciate it if you can't say more than that. No, I think they were quite open and transparent that, uh, um, you know, we had spoken and that they were they were looking into it. What I, what I quite appropriately couldn't get from them is uh, where they will go with that now when they make their decision, hopefully in the short term. I can appreciate that. I think uh, I've heard the term active and ongoing for eight years, so I'm used to that. So just a few quick comments, because uh, I, I, what your uh, and the clerk's intent was with uh, this report and the way that maybe uh, my perception was in reading it might, uh, it might be the same, but I may not have taken it that way. So that what I've jotted down is, um, I mean, while the inquiry was going on, uh, I think I was hearing, I don't speak for anybody else, a uh, combination of... Uh, of two comments. One was people that were saying, we all knew this was going on all along. And the other one was people in shock saying, I can't believe that this went on. Uh, then the uh, inquiry concluded and the report came out three months ago tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. And there was a lot of uh, people that I don't think understood what, uh, um, the, what the judicial inquiry could and couldn't do. So there was a lot of people saying, is this all we got? Uh, was 914 pages and nobody was held accountable. And I think it, it, in all fairness, most of those people didn't understand that what the JI could and couldn't do. But uh, as I say, it's, it's three months tomorrow since the report came out and, and we get your staff report. Um, council hasn't talked to our lawyers yet. Um, and I'm sure it can't just be me that has questions. Um, council hasn't even really discussed going forward at the table other than the night we all did sort of a, a comment session on it. So 
what I'm not finding in here in your intent may have been, but it's not, uh, it, it's not good enough for me, if I may, is uh, a firm and aggressive timeline on speaking to uh, the parties that know this stuff better than we do, the lawyers and your predecessors. Um, uh, I'd like to see that happen. And I'd like to see a fast discussion, not, you know, you're saying the, the lawyers may be ready to come forward mid mid February, but none of this is sure. I just like to see us be able to look the public in the eye and say that we've explored all the options. And I think after three months that we're just getting started on this, I'd like to see us be a lot more aggressive at it. Um, and I'm curious to see the comments of my colleagues. Uh, thank you, Councillor Berman. Uh, CEO Skinner, do you want to respond to any of those comments? <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. I, I think I, uh, well, at this point, we'll just say I, I hear you and I understand. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions, Council? I have Councillor McLeod. Uh, Sarah, did just before we get going, did you? Is there a procedural issue? Sorry, Your Worship. Um, just a reminder that we are in standing committee and we should be opening it to the public. Oh yes. Uh, my apologies. All right, Sarah. Do we have anyone in the public who wants to speak to this item? Yes, we do. And just a reminder to uh, the others that are attending, if you wish to speak, please press the raise your hand feature or star nine. We do have one individual. I believe it's uh, Mr. Fryer. So we will allow him to talk. All right. Mr. Fryer, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, and I won't be repeating anything from earlier as, uh, as procedurally. That's the way to do it. Um, firstly, I agree and support the assessment that regarding the inappropriate and untrustworthy actions of the individuals identified in the police report, as well as the commissioner's findings, the OPP will determine what their next steps may be. I had stated at the November 4th SIC when the initial draft staff report was verbally presented that I could only provide brief comment but would follow up in written form after further consideration which I did during the course of what was the three months of time because in December the focus was on moving through budget and January scheduled SIC was cancelled, contributing to your packed agenda today. Following the November meeting, I did offer to assist senior staff, as was intended with the legal representatives and the former CAOs, to hopefully provide my insights. It wasn't deemed necessary, so I have continued my independent analysis work. I will require further cooperation though going forward because my preference continues to be to first run things by senior staff to obtain the factual detail that I require before addressing council. There are matters about this draft report that still stand out to me after staff's additional clarifications in the presentation. My input mostly centers around what is noted on page seven in regards to the community-based strategic plan objective to continually improve Collingwood's financial context. The table on page five really is a summary of direct costs and what's listed in paragraph two should include that there was some participants cost coverage too. I specify about this because as I previously submitted to council on the December 23rd consent agenda, the associated cost control measure that I exercise by representing myself avoiding legal and back office expense for Collingwood appears to be the only control that was ever exercised. I will further address this in my more detailed uh, response when I provide my written response on the questions from the delegation portion. Regarding the table salaries category showing $250,000, this is an example of why these are direct costs. It is my understanding that even though I was assured in March 2018 that all costs for inquiry related staff undertakings would be tracked and recorded, this was not done. Therefore, the indirect cost, if you want to look at it that way, has not been recorded the way Staff Report T 2018 06 required that it should be. There are other costs too, such as EPCORs, that likewise should be reported in an overall total cost report. I look at it this way. If I was in a public position and a colleague from a peer municipality 
that was considering an inquiry asked as to what the costs of Collingwood's inquiry process had been, I would, wouldn't only use the amounts listed on page 5 to provide an accurate response. I also would add that footnote 5 on page 10 contributes to the continually confusing cost references that have plagued this matter from the outset by indicating that there was an original estimate of between 1.5 to 2.5 million. This is the first time I can recall seeing anything about this as the original estimate. It has no source indicated either, so it would be beneficial to see that cited. I submit that this historic report needs to be updated to ensure that it is factually accurate as possible. In addition to the above, it should include a proper financial timeline list, timeline list because of all the various estimates relating to costs and funding that have been presented to the public over the past three years. Regarding Section 5, Effect on Town Finances, it also only reflects about anticipated direct cost impacts. It suggests that any expected costs will be covered by the budget. Is the 2021 budget amount the $700,000 that staff stated in local media on December 15th, which I utilized along with others in our observations? Even if it is a different amount than the 700000 the correct amount should be stated there to avoid any further confusion. In my opinion, the suggestions I have respectfully made would help the report provide the full and transparent financial context required to meet the community-based strategic plan's objective. Additionally, it should help to minimize the chance of erroneously identifying observations that are utilizing publicly stated amounts as inaccurate. Again, thank you for the opportunity to present. Hello. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Fryer. We have your suggestions and we'll deal with them accordingly. Uh, Sarah, do we have anyone else who would like to address council? Your Worship, it looks like there's no further request to speak at this time. All right. Thank you for the reminder, Sarah. All right, council, are there any other questions or comments on the staff report? Uh, Councillor McLeod, and then I have Councillor Hamlin and Councillor Doherty. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple of uh, questions uh, about the report. Um, uh, looking for some clarification on a couple of issues, and 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 one of which is um, uh, partially touched on by uh, CAO Skinner when she said that she's had no get out. Sorry, my dog wants to play. Um, when she was talking about uh, having spoken with our legal counsel, and and I wonder if maybe we could just. Uh, I could get you to expand on that and to talk about what it is that was discussed and and what the likelihood is that we will actually have an in-camera discussion with our legal counsel sometime before the end of this month. Uh, CEO Skinner. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor McLeod. Uh, so we provided a, a set of... Uh, of uh, questions to our, uh, our JI legal counsel, um, straightforward questions, which is, are there any legal avenues that the town um, you know, could or should pursue? And um, the, uh, was there any uh, comments on the process uh, that, uh, and how to better manage the process in the future uh, were the two that come directly to mind? Um, and uh, they have committed to, uh, to come um, to a, a session of council within February. So I believe that to be the first meeting in February. Thank you. And as, as a follow-up, was there discussion with, our, uh, with uh, either council for the town or council from uh, the judicial inquiry about litigation either against or for or by the town or uh, private prosecution? Uh, and this is to follow up on, of course, what uh, Councillor Berman was talking about with the fact that what I hear uh, from some quarters is, uh, is this all we got? And why is no one going to jail? And on and on and on and on. These are the things that keep getting said. And, and I want to be able to say that we have explored every single possible option, uh, not only for uh, getting perhaps some of our money back, or uh, at least having a sense that justice 
was done and seen to be done. Uh, so I'm curious to know whether that conversation has begun and, uh, and I'm curious to see whether that conversation has begun. Uh, I think uh, see how Skinner appreciates it. It's a, uh, we have to be circumspect about the, con the aspect of those conversations sure. and the content covered. Yes, and through your worship, uh, yes, I don't think I was clear enough when I said we'd spoken with our legal counsel and asked them specific questions. Um, that was the first of the specific questions. Are there paths uh, with respect to litigation or money recovery or anything of that sort um, that we should be pursuing and what might be the, you know, the benefits or disbenefits of pursuing each of those paths so that counsel at a high level could make a decision on that um, prior to, uh, to taking further steps. Because I do think that, um, um, and I hear loud and clear and staff have that front of mind, um, we want to make sure that we've uh, truly taken all the actions that need to be taken with a balanced professional advice. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, trying to say in different words that I fully agree with your, your question and your observations around moving forward, Councillor McLeod. Follow-up, Councillor McLeod? Yes, uh, thank you. I'm going to have to figure out a way to make council and council with an S and with a C sound different. Uh, that's I'm getting confused in my mind regarding them. I'm, I'm interested to know um, regarding the, the lobbyist, lobbyist registry and the, the piece of the motion that is uh, that contemplates that. Um, does that mean going to mean that we here at uh, Town Hall are going to have one fewer staff member on our headcount list? And, and does, are there budget implications of that? And um, was that included, was that person included in the 2021 budget list that we passed in December and, and, and so on? Could you elucidate some of that for me, please? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, go ahead, Sonia. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, no, we won't have one fewer staff member. Um, so our accountability officer position is uh, it does uh, the policy and strategy and operations of the lobbyist registry, as well as uh, a number of insurance and risk items, as well as being char in charge of procurement. And I think I've forgotten at least one, one other uh, piece that falls into that person's bailiwick. And what the, um, the justice recommended is that one small part of that, which is the actual decisions on is this lobbying or not. So the registrar's decision would go to an independent third party instead of a staff person. And that independent third party would, would report directly to council. Um, so we do need to figure out in going forward with an RFP that includes this uh, lobbyist registry set of decisions that we would have uh, the funding to do so. But it's not, I'm not intending in any way to propose that we reduce that staff member who has those other obligations, uh, such as managing the procurement program. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Councillor? Thank you. Uh, in the uh, appendix to the report uh, on, and I've lost the page number at this point, but it is item number 19 in that uh, sideways spreadsheet that we were sent. Uh, item 19 is stated as being complete. And uh, I am curious to know how that is so when I've never provided any financial disclosure and I wouldn't know where on the website to look for it. Uh, it's about financial disclosure by by council members and uh, and the list is that it is complete. I would have, through you, your worship, um, I would have to take a look at that. If it does say complete, uh, that would be in error, but I know that Clerk Almas and I have discussed it a number of times and neither of us considered it complete. In fact, it is one of the, uh, the recommendations that I think does require some more discussion about whether any person in Ontario running for public office should have all of their business dealings, debts and finances disclosed to the public, um, which would be potentially a more extensive disclosure than that's required for a, you know, a federal politician or the, or the prime minister. So um, um, we'll take another look at that one. Thank you for pointing out uh, number 19 being marked incorrectly. Yes, the CEO is right. I think that's one of the discussions that uh, Justice recommended there be provincial communications on that item. Super, thanks. Just a couple more. Um, so in the 13 weeks since the release of the report, 
has there been contact with entities like uh, PowerStream and Epcor and Sprung and BLT with an eye to some of these possible next steps? And, and if so, can you expand on perhaps what that communication was? And if it hasn't taken place, um, whether it is contemplated through you, Mr. Mayor. Gail? Staff have not reached out to PowerStream, Epcor, Sprung, or BLT specifically um, to uh, uh, look at next steps or what might happen. And certainly I was uh, waiting for, uh, for our legal advice uh, prior to, uh, to reaching out to those entities. Uh, there is an Epcor uh, Town of Collingwood liaison meeting um, that happens regularly, but that that meeting is not about these types of topics. It's about coordinating activities within the within the community. Um, so I'm sure Epcor, as the other entities, are probably aware uh, that the report's been published, but we have not, you know, sought out their participation or comments from a staff perspective. Uh, thank you, and and I'm I'm interested to know um, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and this is rather. Uh, a delicate one and and I would like to provide the caveat that I intend to impugn no one's reputation or behavior but I do think that not only what is that old phrase not only does justice need to be done but needs to be seen to be done I think that um, so my question is with those caveats in place was there any consideration given to the fact that the bulk of this report is being written by a person who was called to testify at the judicial inquiry? Um, I, I think I'm going to defer that question. I think that's a, a commentary about an identifiable individual and uh, that that's not suitable for open session. So I, I'm going to okay. defer. No, thank you. Thank you for preventing me from getting sued. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, last one. Um, can you tell me, uh, CAO, through you, Mr. Mayor, what is the status of some of the entities mentioned in this report? For example, that solar vent program that was talked about uh, quite extensively. Has that been discontinued and, and has that been discontinued? I'm not sure that was identified in the report other than the fact of its existence at the time yeah. that the bills went out. So uh, I don't know if uh, CEO Skinner would have an answer to that question. Um, thank you, Your Worship. The um, I'm not aware of the solar vent program still in ex being still in existence, but it's a it's a good question, and we should uh, we should follow up on that one. And um, I do believe I would want to comment on the earlier uh, quest question as well about the author of the report. And I think that the this report does deal with. Um, a number of things uh, that are very much um, aligned with the work of that position and have been well researched. And um, there should be uh, there should be no concerns in that realm. And if we do need to take that offline, I'd be more than willing to have that conversation. Uh, because it is a very important one to have about our valued staff. Thank you. Noted. And I, I, as I said, there was a caveat there. I just wanted to be sure that the public is also assured of these things. Uh, thank, thank you. That's the, that's the uh, bulk of my, uh, that's the last of my questions. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the hard work that went into this. Thank you, Councillor McLeod. Next, I have Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you uh, very much and uh, through you to the CAO. Um, so uh, two of my questions have been asked, answered, uh, because I am, uh, like most members of council and the public, um, feeling uh, that I'm looking for some uh, resolution to the uh, OPP investigation uh, and or to our uh, options for uh, further um, civil or uh, other litigation, uh, but I had a, a good answer to that. Um, the um, uh, second question was in regard to the potential duplication between the accountability officer and um, your recommendations for uh, a modified role for integrity commissioner. Um, so that leaves me with just one final question and that is, 
if you can help me to understand uh, the reason for the proposed white papers, are those, are you in expecting that those papers would deal with recommendations that are already included among the 306 uh, and uh, how those would be uh, knitted into consolidating bylaws for procurement and code of conduct and council staff relations and so on, or uh, these white papers to answer questions that go beyond the recommendations uh, and as an example, um, uh, should, should the decision to uh, pursue a judicial inquiry uh, be uh, subject to a two-third vote of, of uh, council? Um, if uh, a municipality should have access to provincial funding to support findings that are beneficial to all municipalities, which by the way, was a good get and a, and a good recommendation and so on. So if you can just help me to understand the reason for the white papers, because it then takes us into another, you know, five months before we, we seal this up and, and put it behind us once and for all. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, uh, Councillor Doherty. That's a really good questions. Um, essentially the, the colloquial term white paper would would typically be used when you were creating legislation or regulation or bylaws, when you had the draft of what you thought you were going to go forward with, uh, but you weren't presenting it in the, in the, uh, the debate hall as uh, uh, you wanted to go out and get some public input on it first. So the idea with these is to take the recommendations from being 306 uh, lists to a set, a, you know, a relatively small set of bylaws and uh, proposed changes to legislation at the provincial level uh, and things of the sort that could then be commented on quite directly by, uh, by the public and by council uh, in how we wanted to move forward. And um, you'll notice that the third set of consultations gets into your last couple of questions, the things about you know, what should be what should be kicking off a judicial inquiry? Um, should funding be available to municipalities in Ontario who are going to, you know, considering going forward uh, in something like a judicial inquiry that will have benefit across the province once those findings are, are, are brought forward? So uh, the intention is to change the recommendations from from a bulleted list to true products that council would then, you know, be. Uh, commenting on and ultimately we hope endorsing and uh, and to also uh, follow up on those other issues in the uh, in the third part of the session thank you any follow up councillor doherty uh, no thank you that, that's my question thank you councillor hamlin uh thank you mr mayor i just have some comments and I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of knowing we had some residents coming to speak to us about the costs of this and reading the report, which maybe I should start by saying thank you so much to our CAO and staff for this report. It was very well thought out and a very professional approach to, uh, you know, taking this to the next and soon to be lost uh, steps on this. Um, but what, what I ended up thinking was that the problem we, we have that we're facing here is, in my own view, the result of the failure of successive provincial governments to address um, the municipality's needs in holding judicial inquiries. Um, and I say this... Because I've, I've, you know, I looked at it, it, we we are given a few sentences of guidance in the Municipal Act. If there's a matter that uh, is connected to good government of, of the community, or maybe you think something bad's happening, you can hold a judicial inquiry. That's what that's what the province says to municipalities. However, if the province wants to investigate something at the provincial level, they call it a public inquiry. 
And there is a whole piece of legislation. There's a regulation, there's rules. And in fact, one of the rules is um, that they can set the budget for the commission and a timeline for completion, right? <laughs> so where's that in our rules? It's, you know, there's nothing, but if, if the province is paying, uh, you know, they can do that. Um, and I just looked around on the internet a bit and I could see there was a commission that under the Public Inquiries Act that reported in 2019 on long-term care homes. And uh, on the website, they actually had the fees set out for reimbursement for lawyers who were having their fees paid because their clients you know, were entitled to this uh, benefit. And the fees were all set out. And just to give you an example, if you are a senior lawyer, in other words, practicing more than 10 years, the maximum fee was $192 an hour which I would hazard to guess was a fraction of what we were paying uh, for legal counsel, having not seen the bills. <laughs> um, so I also think that, I, you know, looking at the report, so many of the recommendations were procurement directed. And I counted it's, I don't know, I think I counted 83 plus recommendations. This is not a new problem for municipalities. <laughs> and, you know, it can happen anywhere and it has. And the, and the judicial inquiries that have happened at municipalities have largely been because of procurement issues. The question of a fairness monitor, which is an excellent idea. Someone who knows about these big projects, you know, is retained, comes into a small community where there's no staff who've done anything like that before. And they actually help and then advise counsel as to the fairness of it. Um, you know, why isn't that part of the rules already for municipalities? Um, I noticed the staff report quoted um, from the report, uh, a comment from Justice Denise Bellamy who did the Toronto inquiry years ago over the you know, computer scandal because they were buying uh, computer equipment and what Denise said, Denise, she was in my law school class. Okay, what Denise said was, <laughs> procurement is the biggest shopping with the people's money that gets done in government. This is not a new thing. <laughs> so, you know, and I have one more I'm gonna address, but I, well, I will first. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention was conflicts, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. For how many years has, have, the, you know, the province been asked to expand the use of who has a conflict. Imagine if brother was in that list, but nothing's been done. And I say all of this to say, and I know that we are asking the province cap in hand to pay for part of this because it's gonna benefit other municipalities. I also think we should make a submission to the province saying, you know, you've put us in this box. You've given us no tools to set a budget, set a timeline, set maximum fees for lawyers. You have given us no direction on procurement policies where this has been a continual issue at municipalities. You have not amended the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act in so many ways that would have benefited us. Don't make another municipality go through this. So anyway, those are my rants for today about our need to make a submission to the province, which I would hope count uh, staff would take under consideration and bring to us for a review. Thank you. Those are all good considerations, uh, Councillor Hamlin, and certainly the conflict of interest and procurement issues go back to the Toronto inquiry that uh, Justice Bellamy handled, and as well, the Mississauga inquiry that Justice Cunningham handled and he wrote a lengthy decision about the conflict of interest uh, in the private sector and how that uh, it's more stringent than in the public sector, which sort of defies logic where we are dealing with public funds. So these are all very big issues that we will be advocating to uh, at the province and that forms part of the motion for the Simcoe County. And uh, as well, we will be lobbying AMO, FCM and other municipalities and upper tier governments across the province. We need a full court press on this. Press on this. Uh, any other comments or questions, Council? Councillor Madigan. 
Uh, thank you very much, sir. And I appreciate everyone's comments before me. Uh, I just want to state that I actually read this report three times. I'm hoping that I missed things the first two times, but unfortunately, um, the third time left me still quite frustrated and I will share my frustrations now. Um, bylaw updates are, are fantastic, but I firmly believe those who um, are responsible for this need to still be held accountable. Um, Councillor Hamlin brought up a good point. The province put us in a box with this. I, I don't believe they did. I believe the people that um, made us launch this are put us in that box and they should still be held accountable. The three white papers are very interesting. Um, and I look forward to the recommendations coming at the end because I'm really uh, pushing for a very more rigid timeline for this legal advice. Uh, but I, I believe those white papers will be viewed uh, after what happened to this community as not enough. So my fear is timeline for this council to act, for this nine people around the table that were elected in 2018, that if this pushes into 2022, this could uh, unfortunately put us into the lame duck period that this council cannot act on the recommendations. And that, um, th that puts a little bit of fear into me because I was part of the one that pushed for it. And I would like to be, I was here at the start, I wanna be here at the end. So I, uh, I look forward to listening to Councillor Jeffrey's amendments. I agree with Councillor Berman that we need a more rigid timeline uh, and I really look forward to, as I said, listening to Kathy's amendment. So Kathy, please put up your request to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Madigan. Are there any other comments or questions? I see Councillor Jeffrey's card go up. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I don't think it's the time yet for me to do the amendments because I asked for the timing to be after we received the report. But I will speak to the fact that um, as a member of the council who, who voted in favor of doing the judicial inquiry and has uh, quite a commitment to it in terms of seeing this. I feel that I need to be much more engaged in terms of the information that we are going to get from the lawyers and that we are hopefully going to garner from other partners. So I think that council's engagement needs to be um, not receiving information distilled um, as well intentioned as it might be from staff, but that we need to have face-to-face uh, -face, um, uh, meetings with the people involved in this in terms of the legal counsel for us and the former CEO. So that will be the impetus of my amendments to come, uh, but, um, and I will speak to them at that time. So thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak to the report before I read in the recommendation? Seeing none, then I'll read in the recommendation and I'll ask for a mover and a seconder. It's uh, staff report CAO 2021 2, phase one, calling with judicial inquiry next steps. Now, uh, the resolution is the council herein receives staff report CAO 2021 2, phase one, calling with judicial inquiry next steps. And the council authorized proceeding with a request for proposal process for the recruitment of an integrity commissioner whose powers and duties are set out in the Municipal Act 2001 and who will report directly to town council and jointly serve as lobbyist registrar and provide fairness monitoring services and the proactive engagement of key partners and stakeholders. And that council authorize the development of three white papers outlining potential changes to respective policies and practices, as well as the judicial inquiry processes with the intention to engage the public, including a virtual, if necessary, public town hall meeting and engage Collingwood consultation for each, as well as direct consultations with stakeholders, including other municipalities in the province. Uh, and when I said virtual, if necessary, that doesn't apply to the public town hall meetings there for sure. It's just whether or not the forum's virtual. And finally, and that staff report back to council with a comprehensive set of recommendations for action after each consultation. Can I get a mover and a seconder for that motion, please? Moved by Councillor Hamlin and seconded by Councillor Doherty. And we've had a request to sever. So the first item that we'll be voting on is that Council herein receives staff report CAO 2021-2, phase one, calling with judicial inquiry next steps. Are there any comments or questions on that aspect before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in favor? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. 
The next paragraph, and that council authorized proceeding with a request for proposal process for the recruitment. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Jeffrey. I was kind of hoping to do my next two amendments within this before proceeding to the next one. Uh, so you wanted to do it uh, after the vote on the uh, uh, receiving the report? Yes. Yes. And so is the amendment amending this particular? Uh, it's an addition. It's an addition to by amendment. Okay. All right, then. Go ahead, please. Thank you. So I don't have the benefit of whereas and explanations within an amendment. So um, this first amendment is... Um, is going to um, uh, reiterate or enforce um, something we've done. It's going to expand um, what the mayor's role should be. And then I'm going to ask for staff resources for the mayor to do that. So the, the wording's been provided to the clerk and to the CAO ahead of the meeting. Uh, and that council here and endorses the mayor's advocacy efforts regarding the recommendations of Justice Morocco contained in the final report of the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry to seek support from the County of Simcoe and other parties as deemed appropriate by Mayor Saunderson to call to the attention of the Government of the Province of Ontario its responsibility to consider and effect recommendations within provincial jurisdiction contained therein and that Council here and directs that the CAO designate to Mayor Saunderson the staff resources required to conduct his advocacy work in this regard. All right, and do we have a seconder for that amendment? Councillor Berman? Uh, Councillor Jeffrey, would you like to speak to this first? No, I'll speak if needed at the end. I think it's self-explanatory. All right, are there any questions or comments on this amendment, Council? Councillor Hamlin. Uh, can this be sent to us? I mean, it's quite a long uh, amendment, I, I, or can it be read again? Councillor Jeffrey, go ahead. Floor? <laughs> okay. And that council herein endorses the mayor's advocacy efforts regarding the recommendations of Justice Morocco contained in the final report of the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry to seek support from the County of Simcoe and other parties as deemed appropriate by Mayor Saunderson to call to the attention of the government of the province of Ontario its responsibility to consider and effect recommendations within provincial jurisdiction contained therein, and that council herein directs that the CAO designate to Mayor Saunderson the staff resources required to conduct his advocacy work in this regard. Mr. Hamlin. Sorry, I'm wishing I had more time to uh, think about this. I'm finding it a bit unusual that in the midst of seeking a provincial appointment, <laughs> we're appointing the mayor as our advocate at the province uh, to lobby for changes that are needed. And I, and I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just putting it out there as something I'm finding a bit unusual um, and I guess if I was going to support this kind of thing, I think maybe uh, with the deputy mayor, because I just, uh, anyway, as I say, I find it at a time when, you know, well, anyway, I don't want to get into it because it, you know, but I, I just don't think it's the right time, you know, for the next three months uh, that this uh, is the mayor's job with staff. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for the comment. I can indicate that I've spoken with the registrar from, uh, or the clerk at the County of Simcoe and the fact that I'm seeking a nomination does not impact in any way my obligations or role in my current office. Uh, and uh, I don't think it would at all impair my ability and objectivity in carrying forward this role. That said, in the motion that I brought before council, I asked council to authorize myself and the deputy mayor to go for before Simcoe County. So I have no uh, concerns uh, if, if uh, someone wants to amend that make that amendment to add the deputy mayor I have full faith in the deputy mayor as I have full faith in every each and every one of these council members okay well I would make uh, if uh, Councillor Jeffrey would be agreeable I would uh, amend her motion to add the deputy mayor uh, to uh, that job I'm, I'm happy just to add that as a friendly amendment because uh, 
I mean, it would default to the deputy mayor. I would hope in any event in the case that uh, the mayor has to step aside from his responsibilities, so. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments, Council? Councilor Comey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I suppose through you to the clerk and CEO, you know, some of uh, Councilor Hamlin's comments, I thought we were working really hard to try to get these type of amendments if they're provided in advance of a meeting to all members of council uh, so we can fully read and digest them. You know, it is difficult to hear and process and then come up with questions, especially about something as important as this. It's not that I don't appreciate uh, what you've put forward, Councillor Jeffrey. I think just to be fair to all council members, it's helpful to get it in advance. Uh, and then as a question, please, uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, can you kindly uh, elaborate, if you're aware of this amendment, what resources mean in terms of like, what is a staff resource, is it a fax machine or is it 10 people in a room? Uh, well, I don't, I think it's probably somewhere in between. I think it's just uh, authorizing staff to direct um, staff time or the CAO, sorry, to direct staff time for any PowerPoint presentations, supporting material, debriefing notes or briefing notes for uh, the ministers or whoever associations we may be dealing with. Uh, so I would think that that would be the staff time involved. Uh, and I would look to uh, CAO Skinner to see if uh, that makes sense or if there are things I am missing or if those are unnecessary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, staff time is always uh, dedicated to anything that's uh, provided as a direction of council. So um, uh, I think that that portion is um, unnecessary. Um, it should, you know, should the first person portion go forward um, and if you feel it is necessary, that's probably a good reason for an offline conversation because of course uh, uh, the business of council is staff's, staff's business to, to, uh, to carry out. Thank you. Thank you. And we can certainly provide the supports of the type you just articulated without problem. Okay, thank you. Any follow-up, Councillor Coleman? I think we may have, she may be frozen. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Okay. Mayor. I don't know if I'm cutting out. Am I cutting out? We can hear you. Frozen? No. You're frozen, but we can hear you. Or we could. Um, I'm sorry, you are cutting out, Councillor Comey. If you want to log out and come back in, I'll recognize you when you get back. If you have further comments or questions. Uh, Councillor Doherty and then Councillor Berman. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if I should just hold my comment because it was going to be uh, kind of a response to uh, Councillor Comey. So maybe I'll wait till she's back on. Okay. Uh, Councillor Berman. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Um, I had one question. Now I think I have two. So through, uh, I guess I'll just look for Councillor Jeffrey to nod. Uh, uh, the way that I hear this amendment is basically last week we had to vote to, to give you and the deputy mayor um, the authority to go to county to advocate for us. And this is just expediting the process that now you can go do this to 440 odd municipalities without having to bring each one to council. Is that really the intent of this? Uh, Councillor Jeffrey? Uh, through you, Mayor Saunderson. Yeah, it is the intent um, to, to expedite it and to um, to widen the scope so that the mayor isn't having to um, check in with the CAO for each and every entity with which he is going to advocate to make this happen. So I think it clears it up for the CAO as well. That's the way I took it. And my second question or ask for direction probably through you to the CAO. Um, I never thought this would happen because I've never been through this before. Uh, I don't follow uh, or I, I don't take part in party politics. I didn't think it was gonna creep into my municipal council. I'm happy to address it under other business if you'd prefer, but I, I'd like to maybe throw out there that you find a way that we don't, I'd be the first one to call out the mayor if he was using this as a platform, but I also don't want to call him out, to have someone call him out if he isn't. So maybe under other business, we can talk about that. Yeah, we'll deal with that under other business, certainly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, uh, CAO Skinner. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, if I could, I would just wanted to make a comment on Councillor Jeffrey's um, uh, words about widening, this, widening the scope. Um, I think how I've looked at it as a staff person, I absolutely respect how council may look at it differently, is that um, uh, uh, the entirety of council should provide the direction and um, also that some of the things that we want to change may require some more analysis. So an example that we had there uh, earlier today was um, um, there were some recommendations on election training or even uh, what's in the code of conduct potentially being now uh, our recommendation that that also be part of the provincial package. So if as staff we've expressed any reluctance, um, it would be simply that we want to provide you with the, the best available information to go forward with, um, as opposed to having to check in with the CAO, because I think it, uh, that's not the intention, just that we, we develop a plan um, that council likes and we will 100% support you in rolling that plan out. Um, thanks for the perspective. It was good for me to hear, uh, hear those comments. Thank you. Thank you, CAO. Um, uh, Councillor Comey, you can cut out in the middle of your comments, so I'll give you the floor. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, my question was, I suppose, uh, to you, sir, what would be what you envision uh, is the feedback mechanism as this move forward? Would you, you plan to bring regular updates back to Council as you progress? Would it be a PowerPoint or a staff report of your own doing? Can, can we have an idea of what the outcome of this would be? Uh, well, the outcome hopefully will be that we get a lot of action action across the municipalities of Ontario to force the government to take this seriously. And how we report back could be any one of those uh, those uh, formats. It would be certainly an update to council, whether it would be an SIC or a council meeting. I don't think that uh, would change the impact of the update. Uh, we could have the presentation that I'm providing to the other associations and municipalities. And uh, we could have the feedback that we received from those associations and municipalities. I think... Uh, the key point here from my perspective is that we need to be out there pushing this thing at every turn that we can. And we've seen the municipality of Toronto, they passed the city of Toronto act after the Bellamy uh, inquiry, but it didn't really impact the municipal conflict of interest act or the municipal act. Same after the Mississauga inquiry. And those are two very major municipalities. So we need, I think, to bring uh, as much pressure to bear on the province to make these changes on the third call, uh, you know, third time lucky, but this is not acceptable in the municipal sector moving forward. And if you consider that of the 440 municipalities across Ontario, 25% of the population or 75% of the population lives in 25% of the municipalities or less, largely in the GTA area, uh, we need the support of all the municipalities across Ontario to make the voice of a community with less than 50,000 people heard. So I think the mission here, number one top priority is to get the attention of the province to change this. Because I think the changes will protect other municipalities and the changes will give credence to our request for reimbursement or funding to supplement the immense contribution and investment our communities had to make in this judicial inquiry. We've gone $8 million down this road. We need to go all the way. Uh, any more questions, uh, Councillor Comey? Thank you for asking. No, I do not. Okay. Councillor McLeod? Uh, just a um, comment regarding um, that might help uh, my colleagues process what is in front of them. Um, <laughs> I've noticed at the county council meetings when an amendment is brought forward to a motion on an agenda that that amendment is broadcast on the screen. Um, and I wonder if just quickly, uh, someone could cut and paste what Councillor Jeffrey provided earlier today onto a Word document and then have that uh, screen shared, if that would be of assistance to all of us. Uh, I know it would be of assistance to me. All right, I'll look to the clerk. Sarah, is that possible? Uh, Councillor Jeffrey, you had a comment? Just specific to that, Mayor Saunderson, I did just send out um, the, my my notes on the uh, within to everybody's council email. Oh, okay. And I think there was a change to the wording to include the deputy mayor as well in that. Uh... Yeah, that's not included in my notes, though. Thank okay. You. 
Uh, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I personally understand uh, the motion as Councillor Jeffrey has read it in. And further, I'm, I'm, I'm quite supportive of it. Uh, I actually see this as a way of expediting our intention uh, with the province, well, with the county and with the province uh, to lobby for these changes uh, to the Municipal Act. Uh, and um, in effect, what we're doing, in my view, is adding two more sets of brains and two more pairs of hands to the work that is involved in advancing um, these kinds of um, policy changes to a higher level of government. So I have no, uh, no concern in supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Is there any success? Is everyone able to read that? Is it, can you maybe enhance the, thank you, Sarah. All right, is everyone able to see that? Okay, any other questions or comments on this council? Councilor Berman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Just uh, instead of doing this each time, I mean, we've spent several hours talking about an $8 million judicial increase. I think all these uh, severed things. I'd like recorded votes on so that people know where council stands on them. So I won't ask for one after each. Yes, I've got that. So for all successive votes on this item, we'll be asking for recorded votes. Yeah. All right, council. Uh, if there's no other questions or comments, then I will pass it to uh, Clerk Almas to call the recorded vote on the First Amendment uh, with as amended by uh, uh, Councillor Hamlin. And it was moved by Councillor Jeffrey and seconded by, oops, I've lost two seconds, Councillor Berman. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, uh, Clerk. Sorry, Your, your Worship. Um, my apologies. So I haven't had a chance to really look at these amendments. It was circulated um, uh, after five o'clock to me. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just struggling with whether it's an amendment or whether it's a notice of motion. Okay, well, it's, uh, it is on the topic of the staff report, so I would have thought that it wouldn't require an independent uh, notice of motion. All right. At least to my understanding, I guess further, Sarah, is that the recommendations are made at uh, the SIC committee do not bind council and would be requiring a separate vote as it comes to council as well. So I think based on that, Okay. Uh, I'm going to rule that uh, unless you think otherwise that these are uh, um, an amendments to the main motion. All right, I will proceed with the recorded vote as requested. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your yes card. Thank you. Motion is carried unanimous. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, and just for clarification, uh, Councillor Jeffrey, you had another um, motion or amendment before we go to the next item? You're, you're just on mute, Councillor. Sorry, I do. <laughs> okay, and uh, so all of councils received this um, and the CAO received it um, bef uh, before one o'clock this afternoon. And that council herein directs that a special meeting of council, including in-camera session sessions as necessary and deemed appropriate by the clerk 
be held prior to February 28th, 2021 for the purpose of A, a meeting of council with the Town of Collingwood's legal counsel for the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry to receive and discuss their final report on representation of the town in this matter and to receive legal advice on next steps regarding the testimony, outcomes and recommendations and B, a meeting of council with the Town of Collingwood former CAOs, John Brown and Farida Min independently to provide the former CAOs the opportunity to provide their input on the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry Report and next steps. And that council herein directs uh, that the CAO obtained from the legal counsel for the Town of Collingwood for the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry, a written final report regarding their work outcomes and any recommendations with respect to the CGI and that that report be provided to council no later than 48 hours in advance of the meeting and that members of council be required to submit to the CAO their questions specific to the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry recommendations and next steps for response by any or all of the above parties no later than 72 hours in advance of the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Do you have a seconder for this motion? For I an do. Sorry, for an amendment. And I've got Councillor Berman. Okay. Do you wish to speak now or at? After, at, again, I think it's self-explanatory. Okay. Um, was everyone able to read that while it was up on the screen? I'm getting nodded heads. I just want to make sure everyone's had a chance to read it. So before I start the discussion, I did have Councillor Hamlin, but Councillor, did you have a specific question, Councillor Comey? Sorry, uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Pardon my ignorance. Are we saying this amendment was circulated in advance of the meeting? I think Councillor Jeffrey indicated it was sent to the CAO this afternoon and then subsequently to the clerk um, and then circulated it. I don't know, uh, Councillor Jeffrey, was it circulated after that to council? I just sent it to the council members, uh, Mayor Saunderson, after their request to see it in writing. So I sent it uh, directly to councillors Comey, Hamlin, whoever, the whole team. Okay. About 10 minutes ago. Maybe, uh, Clerk Almas, if you could put it back up on the screen for a couple of minutes for people to read and think about, and then we'll come back and have a discussion. Uh, sorry, Definitely. Mr. Mayor, uh, while I'm on mute and saying that, because don't we have an obligation for our public to see this too? I mean with it up on the screen. I mean, there it's a lot to ask to digest on the fly and then also for our public to just be hearing it and trying to follow along too. So I think I'm so grateful to Councillor McLeod's suggestion that this also become visual. Yeah, and it's gonna go up right now, thanks. Sarah, can you increase the font uh, a little bit? Thank you. All right, council, have you had an opportunity to read this? Okay. Um, I think I saw Councillor Hamlin, then I've got Councillor McLeod and Councillor Doherty. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to our CAO. Um, one of the suggestions uh, in this amendment is that we invite our former CAOs, John Brown and Rita Min to provide um, their opportunity, provide input on the report and next steps. <laughs> so uh, do you know whether uh, 
like, so let me put it this way. Would you be providing them the report you've provided to us tonight and then asking their recommendation? I got a few questions and then asking their recommendations or two, have you spoken to them? Do they want to participate and would they have recommendations? And three, are we charging them? Would they charge us for their services in this regard? That's my first uh, question. First question with three parts. Okay. Yes. CAO Skinner. Um, this is not my proposal, so I can't really speak to the intentions, um, but if with respect to that point, I have spoken to them both, uh, both past CAOs. I think it's up to me to decide who would provide information to the report other than the, um, other than the uh, council, because I think that it is very clear that town's legal council should be providing um, that, uh, that advice directly to uh, directly to council. Um, I can't remember if I said this, but one seemed more inclined to participate than the other. And um, uh, we would pay them for, for that time uh, on a consulting or, or contract basis uh, if the CAOs did come forward uh, with their thoughts on the, uh, the report or the recommendations. Um, thank you. And, and uh, sir, just as a follow-up to that, in your view, and I know you're a bit on the spot here, do you think this is a helpful uh, endeavor for us to be spending money on? CAO? Um, I think if it was helpful, I would, I would spend the money um, and I wouldn't need this direct uh, instruction from, from council to do so. We already have a contract with uh, uh, CIO admin that I can call upon when necessary. Uh, I appreciate the desire for council to uh, to speak with uh, with these uh, experts, uh, certainly people who are very familiar with the process and what has happened um, and contributed during during the uh, the period. I don't think the costs of the CAOs are significant in within the town budget. It really should be made on the principle of council's council's needs and and. Uh, 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 my own. I do think, however, that some of the instruction with respect to the, um, the written report from our, our lawyers, um, that's in the final clause, uh, sorry, second final clause about um, a written final report um, could be um, somewhat more expensive and we might want to consider the costs of that um, or get an estimate prior to moving forward. That's right. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, CEO Skinner. Uh, that was my second uh, focus of questions, which was, you know, asking a, a lawyer after a hearing of that nature to do a final report, you know, without some way to put some scope around it, <laughs> couldn't itself become a <laughs> thousand page report. So, um, and my other uh, concern is if we're going to ask for recommendations that I would like staff's input on, or do you think it's worthwhile through you, Mr. Meritor, CAO, to have staff input on the scoping for the recommendations? Um, because, uh, you know, like one thing that struck me just as one, you know, small example, when I mentioned earlier that I had looked at that website for the judicial sorry, for the public inquiry for the uh, long-term care homes. Well, our lawyer was one of the commission counsel. So for example, like I think it'd be useful to have him <laughs> do a bit of an outline of how that act should be amended to uh, include, um, you know, judicial uh, inquiries called by municipalities along the lines uh, that I outlined earlier. But so again, my question then uh, to you, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor is, uh, would it be helpful to have this section uh, scoped by staff uh, and come back to us, uh, or can you do it on the spot? CAO Skinner. Um, I, I have to think that through. Um, the uh, meeting of the uh, 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 legal counsel with uh, um, uh, all, our counsel, the other spelling of counsel, um, we've already set that up. Um, I believe it will be at the first council meeting in February. 
And uh, we've given council an upper limit, a modest number of hours to use for their preparations. Uh, so those high level preparations, which included process as well as uh, you know, the various legal avenues that may be open to the town, uh, but it didn't include a written report. But it did include the chance for, however, for council to ask their own questions directly to, to, to council. So we think we've scoped that one uh, responsibly. Um, at least for the first step. Uh, with respect to the CAOs, uh, John Brown and Freedom Inn, I have been pursuing what I think to be, you know, the right course of action to get their, to get their input. And um, I think if there's questions that council have that they believe um, need to be answered, um, we could certainly put those, those forward and or we could seek the answers. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, it, it, that's about all of that I can say right at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hamlin, any other questions? Uh, I guess just to comment at this stage, Mr. Mayor, that um, I, I'm just, I think perhaps A is not necessary um, and that our CAO seems to have in hand a meeting already set up and that maybe we should take the opportunity to ask our questions at that meeting before we make a decision on bringing um, a vote back to discuss a final report being needed uh, from our legal counsel. And that with respect to B, um, I think I would uh, recommend following the advice of our CAO that she has this in hand already uh, and that I, I certainly, for myself, don't feel the need uh, to meet with our former CAOs to get their input. Um, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLeod. Thank you. Um, I have. Uh, so my comment is. I don't see what it could hurt to talk to the people who were the genesis of the judicial inquiry to see whether the questions that they had that went unanswered prior to February of 2018 have been answered in the, uh, in the work that was done by Justice Morocco, um, especially if it's not, if it's, if it already falls within the purview of, of our, um, of our expenses and the, and, um, I think it can't hurt to ask no matter what um, and, and find out what they have to say. They could very well turn us down. And uh, so could, um, so could uh, Mr. McDowell uh, turn us down. But I think it can't hurt. I mean, I, I, I am quite frankly baffled that we have not heard from them yet, particularly Mr. McDowell, because I, I got a traffic ticket once and got a debrief on the way out of the court with my lawyer. So I don't understand how we spent $8 million or however many million we spent with his particular firm. And we haven't heard from him in the 13 weeks since the, since the report came, came due or came out. I, I, I am baffled by that. And uh, so I don't think it can hurt to ask. And, uh, <laughs> and frankly, I think with the amount of money that we spent, we should get something in writing from him on how he feels it went or what got left out that ought not to have been left out. I don't know, something. I want to leave no stone unturned in this process. And I want to be able to look people in the eye at the grocery store, if ever we can go live into a grocery store again, and say, we did everything that we can possibly do to figure this out. And so I will be supporting this amendment and, uh, and anything else we can possibly do to get it figured out. Thank you. Councillor Doherty, I have you next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'm of the view that we have spent enough money on this inquiry. We have two preliminary reports coming from phase one and phase two. We have a 900 page plus summary and recommendations uh, from our uh, Justice Morocco. 
and I see I, I see no point in in um, asking for any anything further. I cannot imagine that there would be anything further coming from our former CAOs or our council, uh, but more bills. Uh, so what I would like to ask is that we, if we could, um, Councillor Jeffrey, if we could sever your second amendment uh, A and B, because I would support uh, um, the first part of the amendment item A, having to do with in camera and speaking to our legal counsel uh, re regarding next steps in terms of the testimony outcomes and recommendations, but I would go no further. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hall. Um, I'll just be brief and that is that I would like to uh, support the amendments as they've been presented. Uh, I too will echo uh, comments of uh, Councillor McLeod and a few others that uh, I very much would like to hear from uh, our two former CAOs if they uh, permit uh, time and, and uh, are willing to contribute. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to hear from our, uh, our um, solicitor. I completely agree from Councillor McLeod's perspective that, uh, uh, and I'll add to it, that throughout the entire process, we had uh, a couple of occasions to go in camera and speak to our solicitors. And uh, it surprises me that uh, we have not had that opportunity since uh, the report was uh, um, uh, delivered by the justice. Uh, and specific to uh, Mr. Brown, former CAO Brown, uh, there may be no person in this community who has, is as invested in this entire process as he is. And I would very much like to hear from him whether he feels that this report delivers on something that um, in large part he uh, started. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Berman. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So quickly, uh, A, I'll be supporting this and B, um, I don't know the right words, but it, it fascinates me that both former CAOs were considered valuable as witnesses in parts two and three of the inquiry, but not relevant to come and speak to council. So I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Comey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I suppose, you know, this motion makes me think of that concept, you know, uh, a meeting that could have been an email. So I guess my question is to you, sir, you know, Councillor McLeod's deeply concerned that we haven't heard from our solicitor, have, have you attempted to call or reach out to them subsequent to? I don't have that authority. Uh, I can't contact and uh, neither can anyone of council contact our solicitors or any, any other or consultants independently. That all goes through the CAO. That is uh, a council direction to staff. So the answer to that is no. Okay, for that reason. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and the second uh, part of my comment is I, I agree with uh, Councillor Dory. I just, I'm at my absolute spending limit for uh, for our taxpayers when, when it comes to this. I feel every confident in our, our CAO and the reports we've received and our path forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jeffrey, you got asked to go last, so I will make my comments and they're just very simple. And that is that, uh, this motion is not at all, uh, in my opinion, um, to be a reflection of the hard work that this current staff has put in. This has been a massive undertaking and uh, to come in with uh, without having experienced, well, I think, first of all, the decisions of 2010 and 2014 to 2014, and then the follow-up through 2014 to 2018 that gave birth to this uh, judicial inquiry. I think it is a very difficult uh, uh, task to try and uh, understand, not, and, and I don't, not the intellectually understand, but to understand, I think, the emotional toll and the, the uh, grips of that decision that this count, the past council went through to get to the decision where we are today. And so for that reason, I, I believe that hearing from the former CAOs who had lived through that uh, to get their perspective um, is, is not uh, I think inappropriate, but uh, 
and so I will be supporting it, but uh, we had from Councillor Doherty uh, a request to sever, so we will be voting on item A of the Second Amendment first, and then the balance, and Councillor Jeffrey, you have last word. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I think um, that uh, my colleagues have covered most of the points that I would have. Um, I don't know what I don't know. I do think it's odd that we would not receive a final report from our solicitors in such a, a public and um, I think will be a precedent setting um, ruling or report going forward. And um, so I am um, I'm very much hoping that this is supported so that we can uh, leave no uh, stone unturned. Thank you. So first we will be calling the vote on item 3A and there's been a request for recorded vote. So I will pass this to the clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Sorry, uh, I'm just looking at the motion. Did you, um, the request to sever, was it just taking B out and the remainder of the entire amendment staying as is? Uh, I guess a very good clarification from Councillor Doherty. Uh, Councillor Doherty, was it just uh, taking B out separately and keeping in the successive paragraphs or was it hiving uh, everything below uh, A out? Sorry, Councillor, you're, you're muted. Uh, would be taking everything uh, below B out for me. Okay, so we've severed below everything below B, uh, Sarah. <coughs> okay, that is great. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor, please raise your yes cards. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your no cards. Thank you. Motion is carried. All right, and then the second motion is for everything below a B or a B and down. So it includes a meeting of council uh, with former CAOs and, and the town direct CA, CAO to obtain the from the legal counsel for the town of Collingwood uh, for the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry a, a final written report uh, with questions to be or to be submitted uh, 48 hours in advance of the meeting and the council may uh, submit questions to the CAO for our council uh, 72 hours prior to the meeting. I'll pass that to the clerk, please. Certainly a recorded vote has been requested for this. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your yes card. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your no. Thank you, motion is carried. All right. Uh, and then that brings us to the uh, second paragraph of the main motion. And the council authorized proceeding with the request for proposal process for the recruitment of an integrity commissioner whose powers and duties are set out in the Municipal Act 2001 and who will report directly to town council and jointly serve as lobbyist registrar and provide fairness monitoring services and the proactive engagement of key partners and stakeholders. Are there any questions or comments on this paragraph council? Seeing none, I will pass it to the clerk because there's been a request for a recorded vote. Certainly, Your Worship. A recorded vote's been requested. All those in favor of this motion, please raise your yes cards. Thank you. There's no opposed. Motion is carried. All right. In the third paragraph, and that council authorized the development of three white papers outlining potential changes to respective policies and practices, as well as judicial inquiry processes with intention to engage the public, including a virtual public, if necessary, uh, town public town hall meeting and engage Collingwood consultation for each, as well as direct consultations with stakeholders, including other municipalities and the province. Council questions or comments on this? Councilor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I'd like to um, defer um, this paragraph, and just to give you a heads up, the next one as well, um, until we have received all of the information and answered any questions council has through our process with the former CAOs and our, CAOs and our uh, legal counsel. Okay, and uh, my understanding from the last, your last amendment is that uh, we're hoping to have all those meetings concluded by February 28, 2021. 
Is that correct, uh, yes, Councilor Jeffrey? Yeah. Yes, okay, so you're asking that this be deferred until those processes are complete? Yes, I am. And according to, to the uh, CAO's updates or information for potential, we may be done with it prior to February 28th. Okay. Uh, there, uh, well, this is a request for a deferral, so uh, there's no discussion. Uh, Councillor Berman, are you seconding this? Okay. All right, we have a question for a, um, a motion to defer this uh, so that staff can have the benefit of the information uh, collected at the meetings that we have just passed in the amendment. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Berman, do you want a recorded vote on this? Okay, so we had a request for a recorded vote. Uh, Clerk Thomas. Certainly all, fav all in favor of the deferral, please raise your yes cards. Thank you, all those opposed, please raise your no card. Thank you, motion is carried. Okay. So that, uh, Brings us to our next report, which is staff report C2021-2, establishment and terms of reference affordable housing task force. And I will turn it over to staff. Who's presenting this? Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry, Your Worship. Just as a reminder, we're coming up to the five hour mark, which we would need a motion to extend. So um, based on priorities right now. I, I don't know if you're interested in moving the tax relief staff report first, and then council can decide should they wish to um, hear the other ones this evening, we can proceed with those. That's a good suggestion, Sarah, let's, uh, let's do that. So that takes us then to uh, staff report T2021-1, uh, uh, COVID-19 economic relief tax penalty and interest relief be received, or sorry, report uh, penalty interest and relief. And so uh, who will be presenting on this from staff, Sarah or, Sia, or Sonia, who will be dealing with this? Monica, welcome. Yes, our our new treasurer on her uh, very first day as official treasurer status, uh, our uh, treasurer, Quinlan, please. Thank you, Sonia, and welcome uh, treasurer Quinlan. And uh, it's great to have you. Thank you. and the beginning of a long uh, auspicious relationship. So if you can take us through this report, that would be great, please. Sure, thank you, Your Worship. So um, I'll try and go a little bit quickly, but uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've had, staff has had quite a few calls from residents and taxpayers with concerns about being able to make the due date on February 19th. So looking at that, we did reach out to several different uh, municipalities to find out what they were doing and how they were treating it. Um, we did get a response that two, um, sorry, out of the nine municipalities in the area were also providing tax relief. We, pardon me, I've got a frog in my throat. <clears throat> we then took a look at how much penalty and interest we generally accumulate over the last couple of months. And it looks like it's about 20,000 per month for the current year's taxes only. So it would cost us about $40,000 a year at this point to go forward with this, or sorry, $40,000 over the next two months to go forward with this. We as staff felt that there was quite a bit of pressure on our taxpayers and our residents given the continued pandemic for COVID. Um, and we felt that this was a relatively, you know, you know, little impact way to provide some relief as much as possible for now. So that was kind of my take. And I'm sorry, I have a really bad frog in my throat. So I think that's it. All right. Thank you. Council, are there any questions or comments on this item? Go ahead, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you to uh, Treasurer Quinlan. Um, how will this, would this be applied automatically or would the residents have to ask for relief? So our thoughts are that it would be applied automatically. So across the board for March and April, for those residents that are on the um, pre-authorized payment plan, 
they would have to request to be removed from the pre-authorized payment plan. Um, and of course, then interest and penalties would not apply. And then when they did want to go back on the PAP plan, they would have to request to be resubmitted or re-added to that program. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments, Council? I'll read it in and then I'll look for a mover and a seconder then. Uh, that staff report T2021-1 COVID-19 economic relief, tax penalty and interest relief be received. And the council authorizes staff to waive penalty and interest charges for the months of March and April, 2021 with respect to the current year's tax payable, taxes payable only, i.e. for 2021. <laughs> Um, so I can I get a move under council? So Jeffrey and Councilor Berman, uh, we've had questions or comments. So unless there's any pressing issues, then I'm going to call the vote. All in favor? And that is passed unanimously. Thank you, Monica. You hit it out of the park. Uh, so then um, we've got. Uh, so Sarah, I guess we have a decision to make. We've got five, four hours and fifty minutes on this meeting. We have two items that we have not yet dealt with, which are uh, um, the establishment in terms of reference affordable housing task force and the uh, committee and board governance review. Given the late hour, um, if uh, council, is there uh, opinions amongst council that these are urgent issues that need to be dealt with now? Seeing none, then I guess uh, go ahead, Councillor Doherty. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize it was rhetorical. Uh, no, I didn't feel that they were urgent. However, I was going to suggest that perhaps we could deal with them later this week as opposed to putting them off uh, for any uh, lengthy period of time, certainly not until next month. Yeah, I don't know if we can do that without uh, striking a special meeting. Um, so uh, I guess uh, to you, Sarah, is there a possibility that uh, one of the, any of these items could come up at a, at a standing committee meeting other than the SIC, you know, that so that it gets to council before or this month? Uh, through your worship, we, we could recess the meeting and reconvene at a later date, um, providing, you know, not a shorter than 48 hours notice of when that meeting date's going to be. So if, if, if the committee preferred to recess this meeting, we could work with uh, members of council to determine an appropriate uh, date that works with everybody's schedule. Okay, well, um, if that's the case, could we not uh, recess it until next Monday uh, and start at two in the afternoon on that day, since we seem to have cleared these days. So perhaps if I'm seeing heads nod, but is that... Uh, Agreeable to everyone that we will recess this uh, so that we can reconvene the SIC meeting uh, next Monday, January or February 8th um, at uh, 2 p.m. Does that work for everyone? Uh, okay, Councillor Hanlon. I'm perfectly uh, fine to uh, start at 2, but I would just ask if we could have an hour break before the start of the Development and Operations Committee meeting. Uh, let's hope we can do that. I, I think we've broken the back of a significant meeting here, but uh, so we would just have the two items, I guess, departmental updates uh, before we break today. I do think we should be giving an opportunity for public delegations uh, and then we would have an adjournment. So we would pick up next meeting uh, covering the uh, establishment in terms of reference for the affordable housing task force, the committee and board governance review. Uh, and then other business, because uh, I did indicate that I would add that to the agenda. So there's a couple of items under other business. Well, hopefully all of that would take uh, less than two hours in order to give us an hour before the development operations meeting. So uh, if we're gonna proceed on that basis, then uh, Sarah, if we uh, provide an opportunity for deputations, we've got five minutes left. Uh, let's see how we go. Certainly, we, we do have a request, Your Worship, from Matthew Pretty. So we will enable him to speak. Thank you. Mr. Pretty, can you hear me? There you are. All right, Matthew, you've got five minutes and we're under a time constraint here. So go ahead, please. Oh. Sure, sounds good. Yeah, I've got the uh, I've got the list straight here. 
I was just reading this. I won't, I won't comment on the two deferred subjects. Uh, the, the housing is very valuable. Uh, I definitely, I'm curious about this. I, I'd like to talk about COVID actually and the COVID situation in respect to obviously the ski report. And then uh, just, uh, yeah, just briefly, I, I think we should definitely uh, Uh, Matthew, you're breaking are up. Closed. Are you able to, can Matthew? Hear? Are you able to uh, turn off your video and see if that helps your bandwidth? Because you're breaking up on us. Okay. Well, I'll keep it brief then. Just to work with the uh, uh, the town in the sense of what's closed and what's not closed. Just just help with that more. Focus on that more. That's what I like to say. Yeah. Turn your attention away from you know old business and i think we need to really look at what's happening right now and get into that you know um get it get get into that in a different way so that's my message tonight yep that's what's on my mind okay thank you thank you very much matthew all right council so i think that brings us to our adjournment and uh councillor jeffrey you're prepared to move an adjournment uh, Mayor Saunders and I'll recess. <laughs> oh, sorry, yes, we're recessing. Yes, thank yes. you for correction. All right, we're recessing till uh, next Monday at 2 p.m. Uh, all in favor? All right, thank you, Council. That was a busy night. Uh, Sarah, just uh, as we sign off, uh, are we going to proceed now to the uh, Corporate Com uh, Standing Committee meeting, or what's the? Uh, how should we deal with that? Certainly, Your Worship. Um, it's up to you. We can start at seven o'clock. If anybody needs longer than that, we can do that. Um, it's it's however members are feeling right now. All right. Uh, so the corporate commercial or community corporate services committee. Uh, how do you feel about starting in ten minutes, which would take you to five after seven? Is that sufficient time? All right. Thank you. So we are now recessing and the corporate and community services will be uh, convening at 7.05. And Council again, when you, right. when you join, it will be live. So just be cognizant of that. Uh, on another link, Clerk Holmes? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, all right. For everyone else, good night. Uh, it's been a busy day, thank you.